Hey guys, how are you? I hope all is well your way. Ah, so excited to talk to you guys on tonight. I have a lot to give you, which is why I'm going to break this up into two lessons. I'm going to break this up into two lessons and I'm not going to promise to come back and do part two immediately. I may go ahead and do other messages um, because, because, because I have noticed a trend. And that trend is if I do part one and do part two, by this time tomorrow, part one may have three to, um, by this time tomorrow, part one could have two to 4,000 uh, views. And then part two will have like 6,000 views, which, you know, helped help me to understand that a lot of people like to get straight to the point. Um, and I know, you know, if you happen to be one of those people, you say, well, I happen, that's me. I don't see what's wrong with that. Um, but that, that is a problem because that means that you are a person that likes to skip the process and get straight to the revelation. But the process, the part, the journey is actually the most important part of the process. So the Bible says, above all that, get and get understanding. So typically, if you go to the front of a message and then to the end of a message, but you don't get the center, uh, you are a person who likes knowledge, but not necessarily understanding. But the Bible tells us that knowledge puffs up. And so you want to get the Bible. So again, above all that, get and get understanding. Um, so you want to make sure that you are in constant search of understanding. Brother Andre, you're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Um, really appreciate you. But again, you happen to be one of those people that like uh, revelation or not necessarily revelation, knowledge and knowledge puffs up. And see, when people get knowledgeable, uh, what they have a tendency to do is they just keep talking about what they know. And, you know, it's funny because I remember, um, some years ago, probably years ago, I remember having a discussion uh, with a person, and this is like back in 2012 or what have you, and I was showing him different um, examples of pride or when somebody is puffed up or what have you. And I was talking about news anchors and stuff like that. Brother Rand, Sister Randy, thank you. You're awesome. Uh, but I was telling him how, you know, puffed up people, how they do on the television, say how they cross their legs and they'd be like, uh-huh, continue. Mm -hmm. And what have you had the biggest laugh, but I've noticed like behaviors um, that are surrounding pride. Um, and one of the things I can genuinely say is that I hate pride with an undying passion. That does not mean that I don't suffer with it in some areas because every once in a while uh, I will find pride in my life. And I think we all do. And it's, it's a process of um, and I'm just giving you a little small talk as you guys come in. Do me a favor. Be sure to like and share. I think that well, I know that pride typically is an area It's typically an area of trauma, lack of trust or self-sufficiency. Typically, self-sufficiency is the result of trauma or a lack of trust or what have you. And so, hey, Mary, hey, how are you? I love you. Thank you so much. I love you. So, Sister Debs, you're awesome. Thank you. Sister Brittany, thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be dealing with on today. I'm going to be dealing with witchcraft, control, manipulation, and domination. Um, Sister Brittany, thank you. How, God bless you, sis. I don't know if I mentioned you before. Uh, but again, pride is an issue that I think we all struggle with. And if you ever want to find a trauma in your life, if you ever want to find the issues in your life, find the area of, of pride. Find the area of pride. Or typically, pride can also be a sign. Good God. I got one of these little moth-looking things in my house now. But sign can be a pride I mean, sign, pride could be a sign of an area where you're not developed. It could be a sign of an area where you're not developed. And I use that as a gauge uh, whenever I see pride materializing or manifesting in my life. I use that as a gauge to say, OK, I need to really tackle this area. I need to get some books in this area. I need to get counseling in this area or what have you, because God resists the proud. I need you to hear me on that. The Bible says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So whatever area of your life there is pride, God will resist you in that area. Consequently, you will be bound by demons in that area as well. Well, Firebird Television, thank you. God bless you. You'll be bound by demons in that area. And that'll be a whole issue. That'll be a whole issue. Sister Elizabeth, you're awesome. Thank you. God bless you, sis. You guys are awesome. You guys are starting off so on. God bless you. God bless you. Um, so I want to get into this. And one of the reasons that this is an area, I think for all of us, there's an area where we've had to grow. 
Um, typically, and when I say grow, I don't necessarily mean like grow standardly. I'm talking about where we've had the most issues. And the area where you've been underdeveloped, you've had to eat in that area, overfill yourself in that area, stimulate that area. There, you've had to put a lot of effort into that area. Consequently, you will be incredibly, incredibly knowledgeable in that particular area. And I find that in the area of relationships, that happens to be true for me. For example, I got this book. I got a book called Relational Acuity. I've been talking to you guys for a while about it. Still in the editing process. Sister Yesenia, thank you. God bless you. Still in the editing process, but there's one part, part one, part two, part three. And I can say uh, that these two, these three books are, um, I don't want to say by far. I think they are by far my favorite books. And then I have a book called The Aftertaste of Deliverance that's going to be hidden. And I don't know when I'm going to be releasing that, but it is one of my favorite books as well. It is absolutely powerful. That book is, and I'm going to likely have to make that book into three or four parts because that thing is, I wrote it over uh, maybe five months, you know, so I would just kind of get to it whenever I didn't have a client and I just write in it or what have you. Um, Sister Jamie, thank you. God bless you, sis. Um, and so it ended up being very girthy or what have you. And so now I have to break it up, which is how it happens with a lot of my books is that I have to keep stopping and start, you know, because I'm working on client stuff and then when I get a chance to get back to mine. I'm really going at it hard and strong. Okay. So in this particular topic, one of the things I've noticed that I, I did is something that I commonly do whenever I'm writing. Sometimes I write up notes. I got a lot of notes for this. I write up notes and then what I have a tendency to do is when I get to the end of, no of the notes, that's when I sit back and I'll be like, I should have put this part first. So this is the case we're here. Um, I'm going to give you five facts that you should consider. Or do I want to go where, where, where? Okay, we're going to start with origins of controlling behaviors. Um, then I'm going to give you the five facts you, you, can, you should consider uh, before I move into the rest of the lesson. Um, I'm going to be dealing with control, how to know if you're under control, you're dealing with a controlling person in your life. And I also want to kind of make sure I mention this. One of the biggest issues that we have is control. Typically, control is the result of sin. So we, the fallen nature of man, all of us, not, not just an incredible, because there are degrees of control. Everybody is controlling to an extent. There are some people, even most passive people, they have an extent of 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 uh dominance or what have you and sometimes you know it doesn't necessarily be it doesn't necessarily have to be like intimidating dominance but i've talked about passive control uh but at the same time there is a healthy degree of control and there's an unhealthy degree of control when it starts getting unhealthy um it can become demonic easily and so I'm going to make sure that I try to give you as much as I can on um, today. I was going to teach this on yesterday, Sunday. That was my original plan. I, I didn't even actually write out the notes. Um, was it Saturday? Saturday, I knew what I was going to teach on Friday. I think I got the revelation to teach on this Sunday. Yeah, it was Friday when I got the uh, idea to teach on this Sunday. But well, first Friday, I was like, I was going to teach on it Saturday. And then Saturday, I ended up being too busy. So I said, well, it'll be my Sunday's message. You guys know what happened on yesterday. Forgive me, guys. I'm just giving you a little rundown as we get everybody in. Do me a favor. Be sure to like and share. And then yesterday, I felt the Lord overpower me with another uh, message. And that was that. That was that. So I'm going to go into the origins of controlling behavior, the origins of controlling behavior. Um, and then we'll move on. OK, the first origin we're going to talk about is trauma. Trauma. Trauma typically happens when you've been raped, you have been abused, when you have been mishandled, or you've had an event to be a repeated occurrence in your life. So, Sister Brittany, thank you. God bless you, sis. When you've had an event to be a repeated occurrence in your life. So let's say, for example, you have, you've been repeatedly dumped. You can become relatively controlling as it relates to romantic relationships because now you start feeling like, well, if I, if I let the guy take control, you know, I was submitting to, I submitted to Jack, I submitted to Daniel, I submitted to, 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 to Michael and they all did me this way. And so now you can end up feeling like you need to control number two, godless religions, godless religions, or you say unworthy religion, because you can still be a Christian. You can be submitted to a 
godly denomination or a godly religion. Uh, nevertheless, because if you're practicing godlessness, if you are, um, if you don't understand the word of God, or if you don't have the spirit of God, if you don't have an understanding of the word of God, you can become relatively legalistic and legalistic people are controlling. Number three, voids and ignorance. Voids simply mean a lack of revelation. That's all. A void is just an empty space. The way that God described it to me is that we are multidimensional, multifaceted creatures and every area of our life is a state. And if there's a state of you that God is not sitting on the throne, that state will have a void or that state will be void. It just means to be void of God in that area, which means it's going to be dark because the Bible refers to God as light. That particular area of your soul, of your life will be dark. And wherever there's darkness, there will be demons. Wherever there's darkness, there will be demons. It's something I mentioned in the two books that I got coming out. I talked about, you know, deliverance ministers. We can cast the demons out the darkness, but we can't cast the darkness out. You know, the darkness is illuminated when you begin to invite God into that space. And not just through words. It's not just give me a fresh and filling of your Holy Spirit. That is necessary. That is good. But you also have to consider what the Bible says. Faith without works is dead. So you have to eat revelation. Revelation is not something that you get. Just by prayer, you get revelation by taking the word in. You got to get it as knowledge. Then you got to chew it up until you get understanding. And that's when God illuminates it. When God sees that you are seeking him in that area, he's light. So he will reveal what it means as he's starting to give you uh, understanding. And then when that happens, you start to tap into revelation. Uh, but the origins of controlling behaviors, typically, if you have a void in the area, or you are ignorant in an area, you will be relatively controlling. You can think about some of the worst neighborhoods uh, many of us grew up in. You can come across some of the most controlling people there. And a lot of times we say they lack education, but really this is just a form of ignorance. You will see people who are loud, people who have no respect for their neighbors. Uh, one of the things I often say is that one of the ways that you can distinguish between a bad neighborhood and a good neighborhood is a good neighborhood has honor. A bad neighborhood has dishonor. And a form of dishonor, for example, or an example of dishonor is when people are blasting their music, meaning there is no consideration for the neighbors. There's no consideration. Um, Sister Kimla, you're awesome. Thank you, sis. God bless you. There's no consideration for the neighbors or what have you. Number four, jealousy and comparison can make you controlling. Jealousy and comparison can make you controlling. And this is something that's supposed to be dealt with as a child. Uh, whenever you deal, especially like little girls, little boys are like that as well, but little girls have it really strong. Um, it's something that has to be dealt with in a child, in this childhood form. So for example, if you have a little girl or you have a little boy and the little girl sees somebody playing with her toys, right? Do Y'all have visitors over, your little girl is playing with her, her teddy bear. And there's another little girl that comes up in there and then she picks up a doll and your little girl drops her teddy bear and goes and starts pulling that doll. You're supposed to correct that behavior because what's happening is your little girl is dealing with that's the fallen nature of man. So she's dealing with and of course, she's immature, but that's the fallen nature. If that's not corrected in childhood, then that's something that that child will grow up with. You guys got to do me a favor and share now. <laughs> but um, that's something that she'll grow up with. Or something that he'll grow up with and that thing will continue to grow um and a lot of times you know anytime i've come across people who deal with comparison and competition there is a void in that area one and two they've never been developed in that area a lot of times they came from parents who dealt with control people parents who were competitive or what have you i love my pink 13 god bless you thank you sis i think about um a young lady i came in contact with some years ago and she told me that um she had a very, and I met her mother. Her mother was incredibly toxic. Oh my goodness. I, I, I could only imagine her childhood, but she told me her mother was, you know, controlling and how her mother used to always say, I look better than you, call her ugly, try to humiliate her in front of guys and all of that stuff. But I remember when I got around her and her daughter, I saw her doing that with her daughter and I pointed it out to her and she was like, no, no, she did. I said, no, it's the same excuse your mother likely had towards you. She don't act right, but she broke you and called you to behave, behave like that or what have you. But it's something that is going to continue to travel generation to generation. But jealousy and comparison will cause you to become controlling. When you look at your daughter and say, how did she get that beautiful body? Or you look at another person and say, how they get so anointed or how they have this, how they have that. Or if, if I think a lot of times 
what where I've seen it uh, start materializing people's lives is whenever a person starts to look and think that that's not what I was taught. Sister Latanya, awesome. Thank you. God bless you, sis. But um, I, that's not how I was taught. So, for example, I think about when I went when I started doing web design and I've told this story before, but I started doing web design some years ago. And um, I was posting up, and it was MySpace, the MySpace era. Um, but I was posting up links, and I was advertising, you know, doing web design, and I what have you. And I put some examples up, and this guy, he went into my comment section. No, I think he took the time out to inbox me, and he was like, um, "No, he posted in my comment section. I think, you know, saying that my work was ugly, it looked unprofessional, this, that, this, that, and the other." Then he turned around and got in my inbox. And so what he was what he was trying to do was control. That's a measure of control. And he was like, you know, is web designers like you that make us look bad. I went to school for what I did or what have you. And now you got people like you that come out and then you're doing this little ugly stuff. And I wrote him back. It, I felt my flesh. But thankfully, I chose which path to take, because anytime you're in a moment like that, you're going you're at a fork in the road. And right there in that moment, I was at, the fork, in, at a fork in the road and I had to make a decision as to how I was going to respond. So I decided not to respond in the flesh. I decided to just be kind or what have you. You know, and he was being very antagonistic. He was trying to uh, agitate me. So he was like, ha ha, that stuff looked ugly, LOL and all this stuff. And I wrote him back. I said, I apologize if you're offended or what have you. I said, I'm still learning web design. I'm still practicing it. This, that, this, that and the other. But I don't remember everything I said to him, but I know I was nice. And I said, uh, but you know what? I said, you have a good day. God bless you. And it 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 struck him. Um, and he ended up writing me back. He was like, my sincerest apologies. He, I was trying to hurt you and provoke you. And instead, you showed the love of God. You were kind to me or what have you. He said, you know what? He said, I feel really bad. Thank you for not responding to me the way I responded to you. Um, he said, if you want to learn, I would be glad to teach you. And at first I got really excited. I even uh, told a few people, I know I'm like, I got this guy that went to school for web design, but then God came back. And I remember something God said to me many years ago, no man will get credit for you. No man will get credit. Um, nobody will get the glory from you, but me, nobody will get the glory from you, for, but me. So God gave me that gift. And so any gift in its infancy is going to look retarded. If, if I may, it's not going to look so good. But over the course of the years, I got a lot better at web design. Um, it became something that I was doing like almost full time to the point where I got to I start pulling away from it. All right. Fear of rejection can make you controlling. Fear of rejection can make you controlling. It can make you like, for example, an example of control is you feel like a person is pulling away from you. And then all of a sudden, because they're pulling away, you go and have sex with them. Or you go and buy them something. You go and do something because you feel like they are pulling away from you. That is a form of control. All control is not dominant. Sometimes control can be the blink of an eye. The best, this is why the Bible says, don't let her capture you with her eyelids. Um, give me a second. Sister Latanya, you're awesome. Thank you. God bless you, sis. Okay, that was the same one, but thank you, sis. But fear of rejection can make you controlling. It can make you controlling. Fear of abandonment, number six, can make you controlling. Fear of abandonment. You go into relationships and, you know, um, you, you fear that somebody is going to abandon you. And, and I can tell you from somebody who suffered from a fear of rejection and a fear of abandonment, a lot of times when you're in that, either fear of rejection can make you get really close to people or what have you. And then you're always trying to buy or find some type of way, or you may even try to intimidate, you'll find some type of way of, try to hold it, of trying to hold on to them. Fear of abandonment can make you illegally soul tie yourself to a person. Fear of abandonment, and in some cases can materialize as you not allowing people to get too close. Not allowing people to get too close because you're living with this mindset of a packed bag where you kind of feel like, well, you know what? Most people abandon me. Most people walk away from me. So there's no way, reason for me to... Um, get close. There's no reason for me to let them get close to me. And then there's a fear of losing them, fear of being hurt um, that is affiliated with that. So that's fear of abandonment. Number seven, fear of losing control. Fear of losing control. If you fear losing control, you will become controlling. That means that when people get close to you, people get close to you. Typically, 
Um, you may be a person who we talked about yesterday who's a giver. You may be somebody who is relatively like incredibly nice. You just have that that sweet spirit about you, what have you. And um, you've come to understand having that type of, uh, of personality, um, having that type of, of uh, well, just say personality, having that type of personality tends to attract controlling people. And you've dealt with controlling people. You've been traumatized by controlling people. You've gone through your hell with controlling people. And so now you're afraid to lose control. And so if you end up uh, losing control or if you've lost control in the past, then typically you can start becoming relatively controlling. Um, and I found that when you come across people like that, a lot of times they're not like that from a distance. When you start to kind of merge into their lives, the closer you merge to them, because you're starting to create an intimate con connection, they start feeling like they're going to lose control. And I think losing control or the fear of losing control a lot of times has everything to do with um, people knowing themselves. Like in the past, they know, you know what, I, I happen to be really nice. I happen to be this or what have you. But there's a fear of losing control. So when you deal with a fear of losing control, typically you will try to keep people at a distance or when people get so close to you, then you will start to uh, manifest a personality that is not good or not godly. And lastly, number eight is demons. Demons can make you controlling. Of course, we know there's a Jezebel spirit. There's a spirit of control. There's a spirit of witchcraft. Every demon you come in contact with is controlling. But there are specific demons that center themselves around controlling people or using other people to control people. And that's that for that list. Five facts you should consider. Forgive me for moving a little bit fast, guys. I'm trying to get to um, the rest of it because I have a lot I want to give you guys on tonight. And I don't want this to be incredibly long. Five facts you should consider. Number one, you typically become controlling in the areas where you have relinquished or surrendered your authority to sin or another human being. Or I didn't write this one down. Or you've been underdeveloped in that area. What, whatever area that you have surrendered to sin or you've allowed another person to usurp your authority in that area, or you're underdeveloped in that area, you will oftentimes become very controlling towards other people. So here's the thing. If you happen to have a Jezebel in your life or somebody that's controlling you in a specific area, let's just say, for example, you happen to be somebody that's controlled by sin. When it comes to sex, you know, sex or what have you, you don't know how to be in a relationship with a man without having sex and you keep giving it up every time you look around, you're in a relationship and you're having sex or what have you. So you're controlled in that area because you lost control in that area. The deeper you go in the center of that area, the more controlling you will be. So rather than and I'm going to say something that's going to be a little bit out there, but rather than you guarding your children in an area of their sexuality, you may usurp control over them in that area. You may usurp control over them in that area because you have lost control in that area. And I think another way we can say this is you may start living vicariously through them. You may start living vicariously through them. So either you can become incredibly controlling, meaning you don't let your kids see the light of day because you're afraid that somebody's going to do to them what was done to you, or you will put your children out there because you realize the power of sensuality and sexuality, especially when they get to a certain age and you start living vicariously through them because you have lost your control in one area. We can I think we can use the example when it comes to finances. If you've lost control in the area of your finances, meaning you are bound by the poverty spirit, you are bound by mammon because wherever you find poverty, you will typically find mammon or the love of money, the demon of principality. Um, that's above the love of money. So what happens is if you have no money because you're under the control, you have bad spending habits and no discipline as it relates to work, then you will become manipulative and controlling in that area, meaning you'll try to hustle people out of their money. You'll try to manipulate people out of their money. You'll try to steal. When bill collectors call you, what ends up happening is you're, you're yelling at them, you're cussing them out. That's because you have lost authority in that area. So again, any area in which you have lost your authority, you will try to usurp the authority of another person. Number two, if you wrestle with idolatry, you are controlling. If you wrestle with idolatry, you are controlling. You may say, well, Sister Tiffany, how is that? How is that? Because idolatry, that falls into the category of number one. 
you have surrendered your authority to demons and not just demons, but to the very thing that you are a slave of. So, for example, if you wrestle with idolatry of marriage, you want a man really bad, you want to get married really bad, then what happens is you're going to come in contact or you're going to affiliate yourself with women who are also like you. But you're going to also start trying to control their love life. You're going to try to control their sex life. You're going to try to control so many aspects of that life. Because, again, anytime you surrender your authority, you will begin to usurp the authority of another person. Typically, where you see idolatry, you will always find control. Number three, the control of people generally stems from a desire to control the most high God. I'm going to say that again. The control of people, people who control people generally, sometimes unconsciously desire to control God. Here's what I found. A lot of times when we, when people say they're mad at church folks and they're mad, you know, these church folks, or when people start saying stuff like that, typically they have a desire to control God, but people genuinely, there are people out there that they, they fear God. They have an antichrist spirit, but they, they fear him enough because they were probably raised in a church. They fear him enough to not directly try to control him, but their attempt to control God typically manifests in their attempts to control God's people. So to Lakita, you're awesome. Thank you, sis. God bless you. Their attempts to control God typically materializes in their attempts to control God's people. There is a lady um, I saw on TikTok and um, she is the, she says she grew up in church. I think she says she is the daughter of a pastor. And the lady's into witchcraft right now. She has such a hatred. She has such an ha a hatred for God, such an anger towards God. But her anger likely stems from probably coming from a religious church or uh, not feeling whatever trauma she has or what have you. But she's sitting there and now she's promoting like rather than just promote her witchcraft, rather than just promote all this other stuff. A lot of her videos are centered around the church. It's centered around, but it's just honestly, it's a spirit in her that's angry with God. She doesn't realize that she's allowed her personality to merge with a demonic personality because you got to remember Satan's desire when he was Lucifer, which caused him to become an adversary, was his desire to be like God. But a desire to be like God is also a desire to control him. It's a desire to not be under his control. And so that's the thing. Typically, people like that, they are mad at God because God's word came out to be true. His word did not return to him void. Meaning, I found that a lot of people like this, they will typically try to use uh, religion to get what they want because they liken, they liken the word or to, to witchcraft, to chanting. So they think if I say the scripture, even though God says many draw my, nigh me or near me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. A lot of times people feel like if I say the scripture, I don't have to have the heart of God. If I say it, then what's going to happen is everything is going to work in my life. And so I found a lot of these women, what happens in a lot of guys, what happens, they find themselves in an ungodly relationship. They do ungodly things in that relationship, but they have good intentions. So their good intention is to get married. Their good intention is to do this or what have you. But instead, they find themselves in this marriage, I mean, or in this relationship, and they start idolizing the person. They make that person their everything. But they still come to church. They still pray. They still read their Bibles. They still do all of those things, but they will idolize the person that they're in a relationship with. And then that person starts to pull away. Now, just a little bit of revelation for you. Demons do send people into your life for them to pull away. Demons do send people into your life for them to pull away. Let me help you explain this way. The two shall be one. So if you sit up here and you're outside the will of God, the enemy will try to send people to soul tie themselves to you. Once they soul tie themselves to you and they become valuable or invaluable to you, then they will try to go in an opposite direction, a contrary direction, an adversary or uh, at a contrary or opposing direction away from God. And it can typically sound like them complaining about your church. Uh, they're complaining about certain things. You go to church too much. Why do you go to that church or what have you? But they will start to pull you away or what have you. When they start pulling you away, oh, trying to, it's in my head. I see the picture. 
but I'm trying not to draw it out. The two shall be one. Once they merge with you as one person, then they start pulling. So when you first start off in a relationship with them, they're like a God sin. They are beautiful. You're thanking God for them. Everything is wonderful, perfect, beautiful. It's butterflies, cotton candy, and all that stuff. As soon as you become one through sexual immorality, sin, you give them a legality, soul ties hurt. You may be underdeveloped relationally. When they do that, they begin to pull. They start pulling themselves away. They start going, and, and it starts off subtly, right? Uh, but they start going in an adverse way. When they start going in that direction, there's a fight because a house divided cannot stand. And not just talking about two people living under one roof, any relationship can two walk together except they be agreed. There's a split. So you start feeling it. When you start feeling the previews of a breakup, when you start feeling the pain, when you feel the rejection, when you feel all of those things, fear starts coming in. And then you're forced right then and there. You're at a crossroads again. I have to choose between this person and God. But the enemy will try to convince you that, no, you're not having to choose between a person and God. You're, you're going to win the soul for God, you know, but you're just going to have to go away from your church for a little while. You're just going to have to do this for a little while. No, but this is why the Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The reason he's fleeing from you is first, because when you submit yourself to God and resist the devil, then you become like God in that moment. Now, we're made in the image of God, but I'm saying that in that moment, you are surrendering yourself to God and submitting God to my God, which is a form of worship. And the enemy will split, but that person is pulling away from you. He said, we like it when we draw it out. Amen. I will, I will do something. But that person is pulling away from you. What I found, and I have to say this to the sisters, that is very, that's very common with prophetic women. You find yourself in relationships with men who are relatively controlling and you wrestle with idolatry. This is why God says, seek ye first. Anything you seek first is going to become your God. And if it's not the most high God, then that thing is going to become an idol. And one thing about it is your soul or your spirit was designed to worship. And whenever somebody creates a soul tie with you, when that person begins to pull away from you, you're forced, you're, you find yourself at that crossroads all over again, and you're forced to choose between them and your God, between them and your assignment. And I can, can I be honest with you? 90, I would say 85%, maybe 90% of women fail that test. Let me tell you why you failed it. It's because the enemy tamed you. He tamed you. That meant that he allowed you to feel that pain before where somebody actually did walk away from you. Somebody left you high and dry and you remember that pain. You remember how excruciating it was. You remember the trauma. And the next thing you know, when that person started pulling away from you, you didn't want to experience that again. You didn't want to experience that again. And then you begin to reason with yourself. You started reasoning with yourself. You started saying within your heart, well, I'm just going to, I'm just not going to go to church. I'm just not going to go back to this church or you'll find a way or a reason in that church to get mad at somebody just so you can come out of the church. You will find a reason or a way to get mad at the church so you can justify it. You won't be honest and say, I left this church because my man was threatening to leave me. My man, every time I came home from church, he wasn't at home. Um, every time I came home from church, every Sunday, he put me on punishment. You won't say that. What you will do is say, they're not nice up in there. Or they got this issue up in there. They got that issue up in there. You'll find a way to control. I've always, I've learned this pattern of people. When people are ready to discard you, when people are ready to pull away or whenever they're about to make us turn you into a sacrifice, they begin to sabotage the relationship, meaning they start doing things contrary to what they ordinarily do. And you notice that they start doing things contrary to what they ordinarily do, which means they are preparing you as a sacrifice and they're preparing you as a sacrifice to a deity. They're preparing you as a sacrifice to a deity. Okay. If you wrestle with idolatry, you're controlling. Number three, the control of people generally stems from a desire to control the most high God. We just got through dealing with that. Number four, controlling people use soul ties as leashes and nooses. Controlling people use soul ties. A soul tie, when it hardens, when a soul tie is ungodly, it is called a yoke. It turns hard. <laughs> it turns hard. So, they use soul ties as leashes, meaning they like to soul tie themselves to you and then they control you using a soul tie. They would drag you by the soul tie because once we soul tie ourselves to people, then we become a sacrifice. 
in that moment, we can either sacrifice God's will, we can only we can sacrifice our assignment, we can sacrifice our preferences, or we can sacrifice ourselves. And one of the things I found is that most people, right? There's a baby spider, y'all. And we ain't gonna let the devil get in here today. But most people, praise the Lord, most people don't choose to sacrifice themselves. This is why God says to die to yourself. When God's talking about dying to yourself, he's saying self-control. He's saying, let my plans for you come to pass because they're going to come to pass one way or another. But I want you to make the decision. I want you to choose me over that man, over that woman, over that friend, over any person in your life, over that thing, over that career. I want you to choose me. But the majority of people, when tested, fail that particular test. The majority of people fail that particular test and um, they fail that particular test because they're being controlled by another person. Controlling people use soul ties as leashes, meaning they will, like I said, they will soul tie themselves to you and then they start moving contrary. They start moving contrary to your assignment, contrary to God's will, and they're pulling you. They're using it as a leash to pull you. They can also use it as a lasso. They can use it as a lasso, meaning they can take it wherever they see you and pull you. I've seen this happen many times with some of you. What ends up happening is somebody from your past because typically a lasso is somebody that has using a lasso has distance from you. Somebody from your past that you never close the door with, you never severed the soul tie with, you keep checking them on social media, uh, but they can use a lasso to control you. Sometimes the lasso is your kid. They can uh, use some type of control. Um, typically it's going to be a child or an ungodly soul tie but they will use a lasso. Sometimes people use that uh, soul ties as whips, meaning they will beat you with it. They will beat you down with that soul tie. And then they use it as nooses, meaning they'll use it to break the life out of you, to kill you, to get you to want to kill yourself. That's all a form of idolatry. This is why God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. Before I get into the next one, I, can, I say this because idolatry was an issue in my family. It was in me. It was in me hard. And I know how idolatry works. Typically, when you're dealing with idolatry, you will surrender because in your mind, you're lying to yourself. You're constantly telling yourself, I choose God first, but your actions show differently. But you keep so tying yourself to the point where you feel like I'm going to sacrifice God's will. And then I'll get back in his will later. And I'm here to tell you that's impossible. And what I mean by it's impossible I'm saying I can't go hunt the man, get him, marry him, and then we are automatically in God's will. That is not how that works. I thought that's how it works, which is why I'm divorced twice. You can't do that because you have to have an understanding of fornication. God gave me, I tell people I got delivered from fornication while I was married because I had a misunderstanding of fornication. And a lot of Christians today have that same erroneous understanding. Like I told you, the areas where you were deceived in, you had to study yourself in, God had to develop, develop and deliver you in. That's a, those are the areas you have a lot of revelation in. Well, when it came to it, I used to think that I'm not a bad person. God knows I want to be married. We're just doing this now. <laughs> but I, I plan to marry this man. He wants to marry me. We've already talked about it. Or we got a date planned and all this other stuff. It was a lie from the pit of hell. The heart of fornication is a heart that does not agree with God in regards to your sexuality. Can two walk together except they be agreed? That means in the area of your sexuality, you don't agree with God, which means that God is not on the throne in that area, which means that there's a void in that area. And where there's a void, again, that means to be absent of God, God is light, which means there's going to be darkness in that area, which means you're going to have demons in that area. And so in that area, demons are telling you when you get married, it should be all right. But what they're not telling you is that Whenever God is not in an area, even though you may be a Christian, even though you may be godly in so many retrospects, when God is not in an area, you are ungodly in an area, which means you're going to attract another person who's probably religious or ungodly. And what they don't tell you is that they're going to use that relationship to control you. They're going to use that relationship to control you. You may sleep with that person. You may get married, but you're still going to be a married fornicator. I'm going to let that simmer. I'm going to let it sit. I'm going to let it simmer and I'm going to let it sit. You will still be a married fornicator because fornication, sleeping with somebody outside of marriage, while that is fornication, is more of an expression of fornication. Fornication is a heart condition. It is an agreement 
has nothing. It, it's not the act. If I go and sleep with a dude, it has everything to do with what's going on in my heart, which means I agree with the enemy in that area. See, God, you got to think about what the enemy said to Eve. If you, uh, what did God say? Did he say you, you know, you would die if you ate from the, the trees? She said, no. He said, we can eat from any tree in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if we eat from that, he said, uh, you will not surely die. You're dealing with that same conversation in the area of your sexuality. You're dealing with the same conversation because the enemy says, he ain't going to send you to hell. You know your heart. You're a good person. You're not bad. You're not an evil person. That's how you know in an area where you're religious, in an area where you're not submitted to God, you're not submitted to God. Right there in that area, you are having a conversation with that serpent again. And that, he's sitting there telling you, hey, listen, God wouldn't send you to hell. Listen, you you didn't help people to get saved. You didn't did this and you didn't did that. You, you, you're good and godly. Sister Eve, you're awesome. Thank you, sis. He'll tell you all of those lies, but he, if the goal is to get you out of agreement with God in that area. Why? Because whatever area you don't agree with God is the area that the enemy will dominate and control. That's the area where the enemy will have you under his control, which means you will use that area, catch this, as a point of contact. Are you hearing me? And you will use that area as a point of contact, meaning you will find yourself in, in witchcraft in that particular area of your life. Because now you're using sex to try to get somebody to love you. When guess what? God is love. So that's why he says, seek ye first love. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. Had you done that, you would have been satisfied in that area. He would have been on the throne and you wouldn't have been looking for love in all of the wrong places. You wouldn't been, you would not have been looking for love in all the wrong places. You will never find love outside of God. You will find people created in his image. But they're not perfect, which means they don't have the ability to give you perfect love. Perfect love comes from God. It comes from them having a relationship with God. And he says perfect love cast out fear. That has everything to do with their relationship with God. And then you get to benefit from that relationship with God when you begin a relationship with them. All right. Number five, last one for this particular list, controlling people have a trail of bro broken relationships because they also wrestle with entitlement. That's what control does. It makes you sit back and start to reason with yourself. Ungodly, unrealistic reasoning. You start to say, I'm not a bad person. I got, God know my heart. God know I ain't a bad person. New nation, you're awesome. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah, I'm not a bad person. God know my heart or what have you. But because of that, wherever you deal with entitlement, people will start getting turned off. Wherever you deal with entitlement, people are going to get turned off and they'll start pulling away from you. And you'll notice that pattern and it will cause you to become controlling in that particular area. Uh, because wherever there is entitlement, let's say, for example, if I, if I was married and I was entitled and I felt like, you know, um, my husband is supposed to, like most of the time when you see entitlement, you will see hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, hypocrisy destroys every relationship that it touches. Hypocrisy destroys every relationship that it touches. But what entitlement does is it creates an imbalance, which distorts your perspective. And it makes you see a prism of yourself or your intentions, meaning you can't see or empathize with another person because you're so busy thinking about your intentions. You're so busy thinking about uh, what your intentions are and the person, if they just let, if they let me have my way, it ain't like I got nothing bad for them. It, 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 I, I, my relationship and what I want will benefit them as well. You start thinking that way, but there are other areas where you don't see you're being a hypocrite, which means the person is going to see that it's all about you in that relationship. Everything that we're doing is, is about you. I'm getting a potato chip of a deal, but you're not, I'm not getting much of anything in return. So consequently, it will destroy relationships. So wherever you find entitlement, typically you're going to find hypocrisy. And when you find hypocrisy, you will find a trail of broken relationships. And don't think I'm talking about just, you know, like mature Christians. I'm also talking about baby Christians because baby Christians typically deal with hypocr hypocrisy. The Bible says God loves a just weight. Hypocrisy is just imbalance. I want you to hear me when I say that. It's just imbalance. And so somebody wanted me to draw. I'll draw it for you. I'll draw it for you. Give me a second. 
I called it a sea salt effect. All right, give me a second. All right. This is what happens. This is what hypocrisy looks like is when you exalt yourself above everybody else because of your perspective. Your perspective may seem good to you. These are imaginations that you did not cast down. And because you didn't cast them down and then you end up getting knowledge and start learning and you get puffed up in this area. So now it's hard for you to relate to because relatively, relativity looks like a straight line. It looks like balance, right? It looks like balance, but you become puffed up. And so when you become puffed up, what, what you're going to have is a prism. It's like this, the, the image I see, they're like this prism, like these mirrors around you where all you can see is yourself and your intentions. All you can see is yourself and your intentions. So consequently, what ends up happening, and I want you to pay attention. If it blesses you, do me a favor, like and share. But what then happens is, if you keep doing that, if you keep doing that, people start losing trust in you. They start losing faith. So know how a seesaw works. On the seesaw, you're constantly lifting up this man, your boyfriend, your husband, your girlfriend, your wife, uh, your best friend, or whatever. You keep lifting up this person because they have their ideas of how things should be. Eventually, you're going to do a suddenly move, which means you're going to pull away. You're going to pull away. Now, what happens when they pull away is they're going to fall. Think about if you just suddenly, I don't know if you ever got on a seesaw. I got on a few times when I was a kid. And I, the one thing I remember about seesaws is that I didn't like them too much because they used to pinch. And I didn't like when, because typically a person who's at the bottom of the seesaw has the most control because they're grounded. So one thing I didn't like about seesaws when I was a kid, you're dealing with other kids. I think that was one of the most dangerous uh, things you're dealing with other kids. So sometimes what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to level it off so the other person can get off. But sometimes with kids, kids get a little too excited. And if there's no teacher over there, then a lot of times the kid will just jump up off of the seesaw, which will cause you to fall, which will cause you to come down really fast or what have you, because that's how gravity works. Well, this is what happens in a lot of relationships. If you deal with hypocrisy, then what's going to happen is up here, you're sitting here and you got good intentions. This is where the confusion comes in. You got good intentions. You have great plans. But what you're not realizing is that other people have plans and desires too. And you're telling them, minds are better than yours. You're exalting yourself and your plans above theirs. And so now you don't empathize with them, but you want them to empathize with you. Consequently, what's going to end up happening is that person or people will constantly keep moving off of the seesaw causing you to fall. So every time you fall, wait a second. Every time you fall, you fall down. This is called humbling or humiliation. Every time you fall, you get a broken heart. Every time you fall, you get a broken heart. And that broken heart is going to make you even more controlling. That broken heart is going to make you even more controlling. It's going to make you even more uh, manipulative and self-centered because brokenness causes self-centeredness. I want you to think of it this way. If you were, if you went outside and you were walking and you tripped over or you, you stepped into a mine, just, I mean, just one leg, or have you failed, you broke your leg, right? In that moment, you're controlling. That moment you're broken, you're controlling. Because your brokenness, you can't think about nobody else in that moment. You're not thinking about, if, if, if your kid is sitting out there running around and they're like, mom, you're like, shut up. Now, even though the kid may be sitting over there playing with a some doll doodle, just trying to pick, drop that, go, go. You're controlling at that moment because you're wounded. Even an animal, an animal can be a sweet, docile animal, but if they're wounded, they'll growl, they'll show you their teeth. You become controlling when you're broken. And so this is what this looks like. If you constantly keep exalting yourself above people, then they will keep moving and leaving. This is what happens in a lot of relationships, romantic relationships, platonic relationships. It doesn't matter. If you keep exalting yourself, then you'll become more controlling because people will keep moving away and keep dropping you. But what makes it hard for you to get up 
and realize your wrongs is because, and a lot of women do this, people in general do this, but a lot of women do this, is you, you are haunted by your intentions. You're haunted by your intentions. So you're laying there on the ground, you're crying, and all you can think about was your intentions. I was going to be a good wife to him. I was going to give him babies and all this. I was going to do this, but you exalted yourself above him. You really didn't think about what he wanted or what he desired. I'm going to get into the message, but I want to say this. I think about a time when I was working house hunters and this lady and this guy, and when I tell you, I think that was probably the last one I, wrote, wrote, I watched because it disgusted me so bad. They were, this, it was a wife and husband couple and um, it was a husband and wife couple. And I remember the husband had had knee surgery. The wife said she always wanted a two-story home. So, you know, house hunters, what they would do, they would try to take the man's preference. It would become like, you know, you, it's almost like you see who's going to win. They'll take the man's preference for a house. They'll show a house that is the man's preference. Typically, they'll find couples that are on opposing ends of the seesaw. But um, Sister Sakaya, God bless you. Thank you, sis. Thank you so much. You're awesome. But they'll find people on opposing ends of a seesaw. And what they do is because what it what is designed to do is make you choose a team because that makes it more engaging so i saw this one with this couple and the wife wanted a two-story home now let me say something i have a two-story home when i buy a house i actually would love to have three stories but realistically speaking i'm getting older and i know that houses i looked at back in the day when i was in my 20s um, when my ex and I were looking for houses, I remember most of the houses that were two story that were up for sale were from older people who could not go up the stairs anymore because their knees weren't that good. Or it was just very, you know, tiring, draining, or, you know, they were worried that they were going to hurt themselves. So they were looking for a uh, single level home. But I would love to have a two or three story home ultimately. However, however, if you get married, you cannot exalt your plans over the other person's plans. I want a big house. I want my house to be inclusive of everything. And I think that's my introverted side. Uh, I want my house to have a gym in it. I want my house to have a salon. I want my house to well, not a salon, a theater. I've always wanted a theater in my house. I want a big old theater. I, so there's so much stuff. I, I want the, um, I want the, what they call it, the guest house. I want to have, but I want two guest houses. I was thinking about that. I said, I, I like one of them being escape. I like one, but don't, that's just the way that I think. Realistically speaking, Sister Randy, you're awesome. Thank you so much, sis. Realistically speaking, there is a possibility. I can marry a man that says, I want a small, intimate house. Please, Lord. I want a small, intimate house. I don't want all that house. It's just too much work, too much land, too much this, too much that. Well, I can't exalt my plans over his and then force him into something that makes him uncomfortable. So what we would have to do is there's this thing called compromise. This is what a lot of us have yet, we have yet to come to understand. But I saw this case of house hunters and a lady, you know, she wanted a two-story home. Her husband had had, I think, double knee surgery, like double replacement knees or something. I remember it was bad. I could be exaggerating, uh, but I remember it was bad. He had had, and she kept looking, you know, they had, they took her to two-story homes. He found a single level. He was like, it's not that I don't want to have one. He said, it's just hard on my knees. And she was pushing it. When I'm talking about, she was dominating him on camera. When I told you, I tell you, I was disgusted. I was utterly disgusted. Like, why would you do that to another human being? Why would you make a, a person live in a house where they can't enjoy the fullness of that home? He can't go up them stairs like, you know, what have you. And she was talking about her and her child. I think she had a, relation, a child from another relationship from uh, before. Long story short, they ended up getting a two-story home. Long story short, they ended up getting a two-story home. Uh, moderators, we got a sex person. We got a perv on here that don't want to get saved. Uh, but they end up having a two, they end up getting a two-story home. And I'll be honest with you, ladies, this is the thought that I had. Let me go ahead and start moving this person. Uh, this is the thought that I had. Let's see if I can block them. This is the thought that I had. I said a lot of times, this is what happens with women. With women, what we do is, in many cases, we can cause or set the tone for the destruction of our relationships by being self-centered like that. Awesome, thank you. But they, uh, we can become, you know, be so selfish when it comes to buying a house, decorating a house, and we can set it to our preferences and not the other person's preferences or what have you. But 
That is a form of control. That's a form of control. Let me see where I was. That's a form of control. All right. I'm going to have to look up some scriptures. We're going to go back to the first part where I was going to preach from first. Um, but I hope that you guys are being blessed by this. Like I said, I would likely have to do two parts to this because I have so much con so much information I want to give you guys. And I know, realistically speaking, it would be too much for you guys today. Give me a second. I wrote the scriptures down without typing them out. Give me a second. Uh, I can tell you, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 is where we're going to go. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. We're dealing with the origins of control. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. Let's see here. This opened up the NIV, so I'll read from the NIV. Okay. How have you fallen from heaven, morning star? Now that's talking about Lucifer. His name, Lucifer, means morning star. How have you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to earth, and you have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will send to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are bowed down to the rim of the dead, to the depths of the pit. This is a form of, or this is control. This is the enemy saying, this is Lucifer saying in his heart, I don't want to have to follow God anymore. I don't want to have to be told what to do anymore. Um, I want to sit back. Give me a second. Give me a second. So, so let's see. God bless you. Thank you, sis. But I, I don't want to sit back and I don't want to. Where was I? I don't want to sit back and have to do like he, he got to the space where he said, I don't want to worship him anymore. Why can't I be worshipped? I think it's very similar to what. Um, what Aaron, Aaron and Miriam did, because they, they start saying. Listen. Moses ain't the only one anointed here because that's that desire for control. Remember, that is a part is one of the fruits of the flesh is control. But that's that desire for control. You know, whenever a person does something you don't agree with or what have you, you can start falling into the trap of control. And whenever you're dealing with God, you have to understand you God, his ways, his thoughts are above our thoughts and his, his ways are above our ways, which means that you're not going to understand him. You are a creation. There is no way that the creation can fit the creator in their mind, which is why when I see people trying to uh, talk about God in a negative way, especially on TikTok, I'm sitting there trying, like, who who told you that you were that smart? Especially when they try to use a bunch of, you know, verbiage to sound all, all educated or what have you. But that was the goal. Nine times out of 10, what happened with Lucifer is, you know, he desired it. He desired controlling God. But at the same time, God may have made a decision. He didn't agree with the decision. He didn't agree with God's decision. And rather than humbling himself and saying, you are all knowing God, you are good. Everything, every decision you make is good. I don't have to understand it. Um, instead, what he did was he thought he'd make a better God than God himself. And this is what happens with a lot of people is that they start thinking that they'll make a better God because they start saying, why he allowed all this crime? Why he allowed all this? No, we did that. Whatever we allow on earth is allowed in heaven. <laughs> we are the ones who are guilty of that. So let's move on to Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Genesis 3, 1 through 7 again. This time I'm going to go to the English Standard Version. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And this is manipulation. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, you don't need God. You will, you will be your own God. You will not have to rely on him because he is all knowing. He knows good and evil. This is what makes him powerful. But 
the revelation is in that fruit that he told you not to eat. And the reason he told you not to eat it was because he didn't want you to know everything. He didn't want you to have all that power because he knew that you'd be like him. You'd be equal to him and you wouldn't need him anymore. That's the deception. This is why you have people in the witchcraft right now. And they will argue. Some of you be calling themselves Christian. They will argue all day long about witchcraft not being wrong. But in, re in, in reality, they have a desire to be in control. There's a spirit in them that has a desire to be in control and in control of God, believe it or not. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of his fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of them were both open and they knew that they were naked. Oh yeah, they got knowledge. They got the knowledge of good and evil. They picked up a spirit of witchcraft. Then the eyes of them were open. This is their third eye, if y'all want to call it what it is. People have been talking about opening a third eye. <laughs> That's what this is. Then the eyes of them were both open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sold fig trees together and made themselves loincloths. That means they became sinful creatures. They became uh, sin conscious. They, they became sin conscious, and this is what the fall is all about. But the enemy, the same issue he had, he reproduced it in Eve and then she reproduced it in her husband. His issue was he wanted to be like God. And then he failed because of it. So then he told Eve, you can be like God if you disobey him. And she fell for it. And then once she fell for it, she gave it to her husband as well. So let's get some definitions in here. Definitions. I'm going to give you the definitions of witchcraft because I want you to know the difference between witchcraft, control, manipulation, and domination. The definition of witchcraft, and these are my own definitions. These did not come from um, a, a, a dictionary we have so I just want to make sure I say that give you the definitions okay to extract well, control definition of control to override the will of another by means of witchcraft fear manipulation seduction etc to take away someone else's sobriety in an attempt to accomplish a goal take no thought for tomorrow for sufficient for today is the trouble thereof you know, we all want something. Every last one of us right now, if I ask everybody, what do you want? Like, what is this thing that you are really chasing? Like, overall, like, what is your, because they're, they're the driving force. And typically, um, it's not so much a driving force behind us. We have a driving force in front of us. We all have something that we're looking at, something that we're running towards. This is why, again, God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. Everybody, and so whatever it is that you are looking at, Whatever you are focusing on, that's what's controlling you. That's what's controlling you. Welcome, Sister Carolyn. God bless you, sis. That's what's controlling you. And again, if you allow something to control you, you will control other people. But a control to override the will of another by means of witchcraft, fear, manipulation, seduction, etc. It means to take away someone else's sobriety. That means I can go up to a person and I can say, I'm in love with you. I want, you know, and so what I'm doing is I'm love bombing the person. I'm taking away their sobriety. I'm not allowing them to get to know me soberly, to get to know my, my, my issues, to get to know my strengths, my weaknesses, the areas where I need the most coverage, the areas where I need the most discipline, the areas where I'm strong, where I can be a great help me or what have you. I'm not allowing them to get to know those areas. Instead, I've already made a decision. I want you in my life, period. And so because I made that decision and if I don't know you, I don't know if I want you. Typically, that means I have an image. And I've already said this before. It means that I have an image in my mind of how you, my relationship with you could be beneficial. And this is what we have a, a, a problem with, especially us ladies. Women are creatures of imagination. We like to imagine. We like to because we are we are what the Bible calls womb and we are wombs. We are walking wombs. But when I say womb, I'm talking about. We are partners of heaven. We get a lot of images from God or what have you. And we, if we're perverted, then the enemy will give us images as well. And this is why God says casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Same is true for men, but women are more emotional. The Bible says that we are the weaker vessels. And by weaker, it's not just talking about in physical strength. That is true, but in emotional strength as well. An emotional strength. So an imagination to us can be a lot more detrimental than an imagination to a guy. That because we will fall under the power of that thing. When we lose our sobriety, we will take away the sobriety of another person. So if we start thinking about what we want, we start fantasizing about, I want 
all this weird. We start fantasizing about a man being a hero, you know, being an amazing person, being an amazing Adam. We know this dude two days, but we already made it up in our mind that he is essential, that he is amazing because we are in uh, we are in love with our imagination. Uh, thank you. God bless you. Yes. Pat, post the cast chat information, uh, ladies. Somebody's asking for it. Uh, but we're in love with the imagination of this person. And when you're in love with an imagination of a person, then you will love bomb and move fast in a relationship, not because you want the person in front of you, but because you want who you are imagining that person to be. You want who you are imagining that person to be. When you want who you are imagining that per person to be, then typically what happens is you will move fast, soul tie yourself to the person, and then you will discover in the midst of soul tying yourself, the areas that that person does not match what you saw in your head as, as it relates to them, but you're in love with the image. And so consequently, you will keep tearing them down in the area that you don't like because you have an idea of what you want them to be. You have an idea. And so what you do is first you take away their sobriety, meaning in the beginning, you are you use flattery, you use seduction. You are such an amazing man of God. I just thank God for you. I, I really appreciate you. You, I feel like I know God sent you to my life. I know this or what have you. You talk like that. You end up. I'm in love with you. I'm this, that, that. And then sleeping with the dude and doing all these great things and being a nurturer and playing the role of a wife, showing up at his house and cooking for him or bringing him over to your house to cook for him. You keep doing all of those things, but you're not doing it for the person because you don't really know the person. You're doing it for the imagination, the person that you're that you're imagining him to become. And this is where control starts coming in because the more you soul tie yourself to him, the more frustrated you're going to get because you're in love with somebody else. You have attached the face, this man's face to this imagination, this creature in your imagination. But you've attached his face to this creature and you're in love with the image. And so now you're trying to tell him that that right there, you know, you shouldn't do that. I think I think I, I really think you I think you called to be a prophet. The man don't want to be a prophet. The man want to be a thought. The man want to go out here and live his life one way or the man. Let's say he's not even trying to be a thought. Let's say he is. Um, let's say he is. He's passionate about graphic design. That's his thing. But you feel like, no, I don't want a graphic designer. Because mm -mm. you know what? That, that their, their pay can be like really low. Um, they can make good money if they become popular. But I don't want a graphic designer. I want him to be. I want him to be. Hmm. I want him to be, I'm trying to think of something that's pretty lucrative. Insurance agent. Hey, you know, you can get into insurance. Oh, I got a friend girl. She's in insurance. She makes six figures. Because that's your fantasy. And typically that comes from you comparing yourself to somebody else. That comes from this. So you start trying to control him. And I always say, hear me when I say this. A lot of abandonment and rejection issues come from it, it typically starts within the person who's dealing with the imagination, whether it be the female or the male. So let's say if it's the female manipulation. Oh, excuse me. Rejection typically stems from the person that's had this fantasy. You're doing in-house. Uh, you're doing in-house rejection, meaning you have a fantasy of his potential. But again, this is a seesaw. You're you're up in the air. You're exalting yourself in your will, and you have this prism around you about what you think that this would what would be the best option for him. And he's on the bottom of that thing, so he's not getting his needs met because you can't see you can't see past yourself. And then what ends up happening is he's dealing with in house rejection, even though you're physically there, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you're not with him. You're not with him. You, it's similar to what God says. They draw nigh me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. You give him your body. You give him your time, but you don't give him the ability to voice his preferences or let you get to know who he is. And so what happens is with a lot of relationships, and I told you guys here, this is seesaw. What's going to happen? He's going to get off the seesaw. Crash, you fall, you got a broken heart. When you have that broken heart, what happens? You start focusing on your intentions. 
You start focusing on your intentions. I didn't have any bad intentions for him. I'm a good woman. I, girl, I just saw his potential. I was thinking about, you know, I, I wanted to have this house. I wanted to have this and I wanted to have that. And I was going to do this. And you don't realize everything you say is I, me, and I. It's just I and me. I have been around. And I'm, I'm going to talk to the sisters real quick. Most of the people that watch your channel are, are sisters. I want to talk to you real quick. And when I say sisters, I'm talking about women in general. It doesn't matter, matter your, your race or what have you. One of the things I've learned being around a lot of sisters is that there's a lot of control in women. Please tell me, y'all know there's a lot of comparison, competition. There's a lot of control there. There's a lot of control there. And a lot of times I've had, whenever I've had friendships, I've had to stop a woman and say, hey, there's a lot of me and I. There's a lot of me and I in this equation. Like we keep going where you want to go. We keep talking about what you want to talk about. We keep doing it. We keep doing this. You can't do that. Relationships, they have to have a level of fact. Meaning you have to be willing to allow another person to say, hey, I don't want a big house. And you say, but I want a huge one. I want a lot of property. I don't want neighbors. I ain't trying to stay outside of neighbors. Oh, gosh. But you have to marry because you have to marry your vision with their vision. And you can come out with something amazing if you do that. But if you are married to your vision, then you'll be much rather divorce the person. And when I say divorce, I'm not talking about going to a divorce court. I'm talking about in-house divorce rejection, whereas you're constantly belittling the person in the house. And so typically the person is going to get off of the seesaw and you're going to fall. They're going to get off of the seesaw and you don't even realize your hypocrisy. This is why, hear me when I say this, this is why the Bible says there's safety in the multitude of counsels. This is why seeking wise counsel is necessary. It's, it's necessary. And when as a woman, when you're seeking wise counsel, you can get it from a man, but it's always good to get it from a woman as well. Because if you get it from a woman, a lot of times, when I'm talking about a wise woman who's not going to be, not one of those super, you know, I'm, I'm all about the sisters and the man is always wrong. Not one of those bitter women. Don't get advice from them. I'm talking about a woman who is godly, who will sit there and tell you, you're wrong. You're wrong. All I heard in this session is me and I. And you're so focused on your intentions. You're so focused on your intentions that you don't understand that you have exalted yourself above somebody who's trying to love you. You've exalted yourself above this person and you have not given that person the ability to allow you to see who he truly is. You're not allowing the person to show you who he truly is and how you can benefit from a relationship. And I kid you not, I see that this is common. I oft, I've thought about this plenty of times in some of the relationships I've had that have failed. I've had relationships with people and they never allowed me to show them who I was. Never. It was always about them. It was always about them. So consequently, it was just them exalting themselves and me letting them exalt themselves until I got tired. Like, tch. I don't want to do this. This is frustrating because, and I thought to myself, how beneficial I could have been had they really gotten to know me. Think about old friends, how beneficial it, things could have been had they truly not tried to control the conversation, had they truly gotten, and I found this, and I, I am not lying when I say this, I mean this with my whole heart. I believe that what we pray for, we get, but sometimes we sabotage it because it doesn't look the way we want because we're caught up in the prison of self. This is why God says to humble yourself, bring yourself down from there, humble yourself. Because a lot of times what I believe is sometimes we can have people that come into our lives who are genuinely gifts from God, people that God has blessed in your life, but you can get so caught up in your own intentions that you forget that that's another human being who has thoughts, perspectives, dreams, desires, fears, insecurities, traumas, all of that. You forget all about that and you exalt your plans. You exalt yourself above that person, and you, but you get caught up in your intentions. So you are caught up in this prism and when people get caught up in that, they are perpetually let down again and again and again and again because they have not learned how, catch this, to open a gift. Your friend may have been a gift from God, 
But you have to learn how to open a gift. How do I know that? I am a gift. I know that. But you have to learn how to open a gift. That means get to the intimate space in the gift. How to get the gift to open itself up. If you don't know that, you will always take gifts and toss them away. You will always get frustrated because you will never get to the good part of the gift. You will never get to the good part of the gift because you keep exalting yourself and not wanting to use these. I just I just told you something. All right. We were talking about the definitions and I got caught up. I got caught up. I will get we'll come back in. But you have to you have to every relationship. Now, there are tiered relationships. Let me say this. There are tiered relationships. There are people who walk higher like a parent doesn't have to have to fully understand you. You know, right? They should understand your child. A parent should seek to understand a child. But if you're talking foolishness, your parent does not have to surrender to that. And let me just say that. So I don't, I don't want to feed control in anybody. But you have to always look at it. every time. You have to always have the ability to listen, the willingness to listen, the willingness to say, "Let me get to know the people. This person is my friend. This man is my." This guy's trying to be my, my boyfriend. He's trying to be my friend. He's trying to be my lover. He's trying to be this. He wants to be my husband someday. Let me get to know him. Can I tell you something to the sisters? This is where God, what God taught me. Don't idealize what you want in a husband. I don't fantasize about a husband anymore. Genuinely, I don't do that. I don't fantasize about what I want in a husband. I just live my life doing what God told me to do. Each day is me waking up and doing whatever is on my heart to do that day. That's it. I don't fantasize about that because I realize that that can set the stage for control. It can also set the stage for you to be blind when the gift does walk into your life because he's not going to match what you fantasize about. I, I, I'll say it this way. Getting ready to shoot a music video. I was looking for an Airbnb to rent and I put all these filters I had all these filters on what I wanted in the Airbnb, all these filters that I put up there. Sister Danielle, you're awesome. I love you, sis. Thank you. God bless you. But I had all these filters of what I wanted in a relationship. So, I mean, not a relationship, what I wanted for the Airbnb. And I started getting frustrated. I started getting frustrated, you know, because I'm going and I'll find one and I was willing to settle. I, I found myself because after a while, You'll find yourself ready to settle. I found myself ready to settle a couple of times. And then I found I finally took the filters off. And when I tell you, it blessed my whole wild life. When I took the filters off, because I, I email people, because when you're doing Airbnb, you have to ask for permission. Like if you're going to shoot, shoot something in that place, you can't just show up there with cameras and stuff. You got to ask for permission. Well, it's common courtesy uh, to ask for permission. Let them know your intentions because you can go with peer space. Uh, peer space, you can rent stuff, but the only thing is peer space is per hour, which typically you can you're gonna pay per hour on peer space what you would pay for an entire day on um, Airbnb. I was determined to get an Airbnb. When I took the filters off, when I took my preferences off the property, first property that came up, first property that came up was the one was the one I, I ended up renting. Sister Lasagna, thank you. God bless you. The first one that came up. Let me see. What are they talking about? Okay. But the first property that came up when I took the filters off, when I took my preferences off, the first property that came up, I literally felt my, I felt God. I felt this excitement. It was everything I wanted. And then some, when I took the filters off, I sat there, I looked at that property. I went through the pictures and I was talking at that. I was, I was like, Oh, I need, Oh, Oh. And I had just dealt, got, you know, some rejection from a couple of people who are written about their properties before I rented. I was like, Hey, listen, you know, I was like, I want to shoot a video. And they're like, no, 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 no. And I, I, I said to my students, I said, this is why, you know, whenever you're in ministry, you're in business and anything like that, you cannot be a person who deals with rejection. Like you can't take that thing personal. And I ended up reaching out to the person who owned it and got a response back. Of course, it was per perfect. When I say it's perfect, it's better than perfect. It saved. I, ain't, I can't go to in too much detail because you're online, but I'm going to say this. Take the filters off. That means stop trying to control God. 
All right, we're going into definition. We're talking about control. We got caught up. Now we're going to talk about manipulation. This is my definition of manipulation. To extract something by means of seduction, lies, gossip, slander, or bullying. To, trip, to twist or pervert the perspective of another through any other means except honest or direct communication. Let your yay be nay, your nay be nay. Hmm. Anything else is of the evil one. That's your Bible. That means if I want something, I shouldn't flatter you, slander you, threaten to walk away from you, scare you, intimidate you, seduce you into giving it to me. What I'm supposed to do is simply ask. Anything else is of the evil one. Hey, um, could you do this for me? Will you do this for me? I'm supposed to ask, but anything else is of the evil one. Because what we have a tendency to do, and you find in American culture, witchcraft is actually uh, very prevalent. But a lot of times we don't realize we're doing it because it's been so normalized. But my definition of manipulation, again, to extract something by the means of seduction. You're trying to get that, that wedding ring and licking on that dude neck and doing all that other stuff. Trying to, by means of seduction, lies, gossip, bullying, or slander. To twist or pervert the perspective of another through any means except honest or direct communication. You got to tell people the truth. Like I said, I had to reach out to them about the properties. And um, in me reaching out, I had to be honest with them. I, I could have sat back and said, hey, I didn't have to say anything. Well, I mean, I should, I'm supposed to, but I could have just rented the properties. And, you know, knowing that the owners weren't going to be there. And then I could have shown up with a camera crew and what have you. But that's dishonest. Uh, I could have lied and said, hey, we having a baby shower. Is it OK? You know, I'm going to have a baby shower at the place. Is that OK? I didn't do that. I let them know, hey, you know, a short film over here is that fine. Is that OK? Before I rent the property, I just wanted to make sure. That's how you're supposed to do. You communicate with people. This is why, we, like I said, witchcraft is so prevalent in our culture. Even when you have a man that comes up to a woman and says, hey, how you doing? I want to get to know you. Yeah, I've been looking for my wife. But in his mind, in his heart, all he's thinking about is what's in her, between her legs. That's manipulation. That's manipulation. Because what you're doing is taking away the person's sobriety. You're taking away their ability to make a sound choice. You have to give everybody the ability to make a conscious, sound choice without, get this, you punishing them, mishandling them, mistreating them, discarding them. You have to let people make a decision. They have to be able to say, I don't want to, or I will, but not today. I don't believe in sex outside of marriage. Anything else is of the evil one. That is manipulation. Domination. Domination. The act of intimidating or controlling someone else to usurp the authority of that person to bring under control. Oh, to bring under control. All right. I realize I didn't read the definition of witchcraft, but I'll go back up there. But domination. The act of intimidating or controlling someone else to usurp the authority of another to bring under control, to bring under control. Uh, it means to control another person. And I'll give you the definition between the difference between domination and control shortly. But let's read the definition of witchcraft to move illegally or to move against the will of God, power and direction of God. The will of God is that you move in your will. God did not rob you of your ability to make a decision. He allowed you to make a decision and there's consequences for every decision. Now. It's not to punish you. It's just, hey, if you're going to move with God, you have to move in his will. If you move contrary to his will, then outside of his will, you fall into the darkness where you fall into judgment. You fall into condemnation. You have to move with God. Witchcraft is to move illegally or to move against the will of God. So sin is an expression of witchcraft because the Bible says rebellion. And when you know something is wrong and you do it anyhow, that is a form of witchcraft. It is an expression of witchcraft. Uh, the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft also involves mostly when you try to control another human being. When you take away their ability to make a choice, you're using witchcraft. When you take away the ability to make a choice, God gave them will. He doesn't take away their will. But if you take away their will, then you are moving in the powers of witchcraft. 
What is the objective of manip manipulation, witchcraft, and control? Give me a second. All right, I got the okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we'll do the difference between domination and control later because it's not in this order. Okay, what is the object objective of manipulation, witchcraft, control, and domination? The answer is to acquire something that either does not belong to you or to get something that's out of season. In other words, you're trying to hijack your next season. This is why God said, take no thought for tomorrow, but sufficient for today is the trouble thereof. When you take thoughts for tomorrow, you become anxious. Anxiousness brings on anxiety. So if you start thinking about marriage and you keep thinking about marriage and you keep thinking about marriage, rather than seeking first the kingdom of God, you are imagining marriage and what it's going to be like to be married, what, what it's going to be like to have a husband or a wife. If you keep thinking about that, then you become, you become anxious. Then you start having hope. The Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so now you start becoming even more uh, controlling. And so now you start going outside the will of God in order to acquire that. And a lot of times what we do as Christians, we will Christianize our rebellion. We'll say, God knows my heart. I call it the sinner's national anthem. So again, it is to acquire the, the objective of manipulation, witchcraft, control or domination is to acquire something that either does not belong to you or to hijack your next season. Meaning God said, I'll give it to you, but you have to grow to a certain height. You have to get to a certain space of maturity, but you decide I want it right now. I don't want to go through the process. I don't want to go through the development. I don't, I want it right now. And so consequently you try to find a way to acquire it illegally. And that's when it falls into those categories. I think a great example of this is if you find, um, if you have an 11 year old child and child is growing up far too fast. And the child says, mama, I want to learn how to drive. And you say, baby, not right now. And the baby says, mom, you say, you can't get a license until you're 16. There's no sense. I can't give you a, you can't get a driver's permit until you were 14. I think it's 15, but you can't get a driver's permit until you're 15. And so it's illegal, but mom, you know, such and such mom, they do this and such and such dad, they've been teaching them how to drive. And you keep telling them, they say, no, so the child, what the child is doing is the child is wanting to grow up too fast. In other words, the child wants to skip the process of being a child and go straight into adulthood because the child sees something they believe. Uh, the child's been dealing with imagination. The child's been seeing other kids who probably move too fast. And now the child uh, is desiring to go into a season that they have not been developed for. So they don't have the maturity. They don't have the emotional maturity. They don't have the height. They don't have what they need to be a good driver. Nevertheless, the child is trying to skip the process of what have you. Child goes over to her best friend's house and their parent, the best friend's parents take the child out, start on a dirt road, start teaching them how to drive. But the baby can't drive. The baby, you know, still wants to know how to drive and she wants to show off in front of her friends. So one day while you're in the bed, you got home from work, you're tired, you take a nap. Your 11 year old daughter goes out there, get your car keys and she decides to steal your car. Because in her mind, she's just going to ride around the neighborhood, right? In her mind, she's just going to ride around the corner and she's just going to pass by a couple of people and then, you know, let them see her driving a car, what have you, because she wants to impress them. But instead, she does, she skipped the process. So consequently, she ends up wrecking the car. Thankfully, she's okay. She comes out of the car alive, but she does a lot of damage to your car. That's what happens whenever you desire a season that you're not ready for. It's because you are looking. It typically comes because you're looking at somebody else that has something that you want. And so you stop looking at the process. You start taking thought for tomorrow. So you become anxious. And when you become anxious, you become manipulative. You become controlling and you start skipping steps and doing everything that you can to accomplish that particular season. And that sets you up for inevitable, an inevitable fall. There's a license for every season that you enter. That's a legality. Without that license, that license says that you are legally moving in the realm of the spirit in this season. You're legally moving. Your movements are legalized in this season. Because, But if you go outside of that ability, if you go outside of that license, if you try to operate machinery that you are not mature enough for, you set yourself up for a fall. You set yourself up for a fall. So it is to set. Now let me read another scripture. I just got notes here. Funny thing is Ecclesiastes 3, 1, 8 through 8. That's where we're going to. Ecclesiastes 
All right. Get the Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. And we will do the English Standard Version. I want you to hear me this. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. There is a season for everything underneath the sun. And if you don't respect seasons, if you don't understand seasons, if you keep thinking about tomorrow and trying to rush into it, what you will do is you will start building a personal tower of Babel. Every human has been guilty of doing this. Typically, we get a lot of our development in that. And that, that tower of Babel can be a relationship with a person. Now, if you don't know about the tower of Babel, one thing about it is, did you know that they spent over 100 years building the Tower of Babel and they never finished it? You don't know the story. The, 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 the people, the, the inhabitants of the world came together and they said, hey, we don't want to work to go to heaven. Well, we got to go through all this stuff. We're tired of wandering around. We're tired of being wanderers. We're tired of being vagabonds. We're tired of this. You know what we're going to do? We're going to build a tower to help heaven. And God says, behold, the people are as one. Now, nothing they desire will be withheld from them. That's the power of unity. Nothing they desire will be withheld from them. So they begin to build this tower. Now, when we read the story, it's easy to assume that they were building maybe 21 days. Or what have you. No, they were building for 100 years. That, a little bit of revelation. God will let you build something for 10, 15 years. He'll let you build a relationship, have babies with, with the man, have babies with the woman. He'll let you go through all that. And then he'll never partner with you in it. He'll never partner with you in it. There's a season for everything. There was a season for them to reach heaven. There's a season. There's a season. But they're, they're always, one thing about humans is we're always looking for a shortcut. We're, this is why like a lot of our, our inventions today are really centered around shortcuts. We come up to a door. We don't want to touch it. We want a microwave experience. We want the door to open for us. This is why some of us have walked into doors or during it walked into doors because we're expecting every door to open for us. This is why we have microwaves. This is why we have so many different things. We don't like processes, but there is a season for everything. And if you never learn to respect seasons, you can easily fall into the trap of control and witchcraft. All right. Examples of four people in the Bible or four people in the Bible who uh, fell into these traps. I just put examples of four, but let's go ahead. Uh, witchcraft, Pharaoh's magicians. We saw that the girl with the spirit of divination who followed Paul and his crew when Saul had the witch of Endor and when Saul had the witch of Endor conjure up the spirit of Samuel. You don't know these stories. You can find them. You have to do a search. I didn't write down the scripture. I'm sorry. But witchcraft, an example of witchcraft in the Bible, Pharaoh's magicians, the girl with the Pharaoh's magicians. Um, whenever Pharaoh magician he called his magicians when moses was out there performing miracles then the magicians came out and started doing witchcraft and they were able to mimic a lot of what uh pharaoh's magicians were doing um but then of course in the end they could not mimic everything that the miracles that pharaoh uh that moses was doing the girl with the spirit of divination followed paul and his crew she had a spirit of divination the bible refers to her as a slave girl um she had a spirit of divination that is an example of witchcraft um, and when Paul had the witch of Endor conjure up the spirit of Samuel. Now, there is a lot of controversy about that, whether it was the actual spirit of Samuel or not. We're not going to get into that. But that's just an example. Control, an example of control in the Bible. Potiphar's wife tried first to seduce because typically this is what happens is uh, control is usually uh, preceded by seduction in many cases. So Potiphar's wife tried first to seduce Joseph. And when this didn't work, she, she grabbed him by his coat. That's control. That's control. This is when you're trying to usurp the power of another person. After this, she lied and said she attempted to rape, that he attempted to rape her. And this is what happens a lot of times when people can't control you, they will lie on you. They will try to destroy your character. They will try to destroy your name when they can't control you. 
when they can't seduce you, when the seduction doesn't work, then they get into control. When the control doesn't work, um, a lot of times then people will try to destroy your name, destroy your character or what have you. Manipulation and examples of manipulation. Of course, Delilah manipulated Samson when she assisted that he tell her the sorts of, of his strength. We know that she just constant, constant, constant. The Bible says she vexed him to death. <laughs> she constantly just nagged and nagged and nagged. She was a continual dripping until he just said, forget it. If I die, I die. I'm going to tell this woman because she's killing me. And he told her that is manipulation. Haman manipulated King Xerxes when he convinced him to sign a law to kill the Jews. So, where was I again? King Xerxes. Haman manipulated King Xerxes. So what he does is he come out and he says, all of this, hey man, listen. He made it look like it was about King Xerxes. You got these people out here that... um. They don't want to worship you. They don't want to follow the oil. There's really no benefit for us keeping them around. There's really no benefit for us keeping them around. Um, or what have you. So he manipulated him or what have you. And that is a form of manipulation. I think that that was one of the reasons King Xerxes was so upset. I think a lot of times you see that a lot today. Um, but I think a lot of times if you have people around you that are manipulating you or what have you, they, they, they cause you to hurt other people. Um, at by the time you get revelation, you will find yourself so angry um, in that moment, because in that moment you start realizing that, hey, I have done a lot to a lot of people because of what this person put in my ear. This person kept putting these seeds in my ear and I believe this person or what have you now. Everything's coming out about this person or what have you. I think personally, I think that that is one of the reasons that King Xerxes was so upset. All right. Domination, an example of domination. And then I got some more to read to you guys. Pharaoh dominated and controlled the Israelites for a season. We know that they were in bondage for 400 years, but Pharaoh wasn't living for 400 years. But for a season, he dominated and controlled them. Sarah dominated Hagar. Now, the Philistines dominated Samson once they had taken him into custody. This is a form of a domination. So let's talk about the, the difference between domination and control. It is to control a, to control a person means to seduce, manipulate, or intimidate that person. It, it means it means to manipulate, excuse me, to manipulate or intimidate that person to seduce that person. That's control. It's to extract the benefit through manipulation, intimidation, or seduction. But to dominate means to have dominion over someone. Domination deals more with legalities. It means dominion. It means dominion. So domination deals more with legalities. Uh, domination typically follows an agreement between two or more people, whereas one person at minimum agrees to relinquish his or her th authority to another person, either because of passivity, fear, deception, obligation or compliance. That means it, when you start talking about domination, there's a legality. When you're talking about seduction or when you're talking about control, it's usually not necessarily a legality there. It's just a person has found a way to manipulate or to extract a benefit from you, whether that benefit be sex or you complying with them or what have you. They found a way. But dominance typically is when you come into agreement with a person, basically you just say, yeah, you can tell me what to do. Yeah, you can tell me what to do. When you come at that's domination, meaning you have given that person a legality, you've given them dominion. Right. Jezebel spirit. Also, one thing about Jezebel, they do come in different uh, ranks or what have you. OK, what are some signs that you're and when I say different ranks, I'm talking about not all Jezebels are on the same spectrum or what have you. So some of them may not necessarily have dominion over a person. Some of them have measures of control, but a higher ranking Jezebel will have dominion um, or what have you. And that's how they get there. I don't want to go into that, but that's how they get their their power is the measure of it's not even so much the number of people, but it's typically the it deals with rank. It deals with rank or what have you. So what are some signs that you're under the control of witchcraft? The witchcraft of another person, whether you're being dominated, seduced, manipulated. I got quite a bit of these, but I'm gonna move through them kind of fast so that I don't keep you guys too long. We, we got a good timing. We got a good timing. All right, we're a better time than I thought we'd be. Yes, they come in different ranks. This is why some Jezebel spirits you can cast out of a person easily. Um, and then there are other, uh, don there are some of them that are higher ranking Jezebel spirits. They don't come out so easily. Um, what have you. So just think of it this way. If you look at a kingdom, if you have a, a weak kingdom and it has, and we're just going to use a queen because we know Jezebel was a queen. She's a woman, but the Jezebel spirit can be in men as well. So 
Let's not go there because I always know there's somebody, somebody going to come in the comments. They get being men as well. Okay, we get that. All right, but let's just say you have two kingdoms. Um, one kingdom was about a thousand citizens strong. And there's a Jezebel, a woman over there that had a Jezebel spirit. She rules over them. But then you had a kingdom over here that's 5,000 citizens strong. Who's more powerful? Typically the one that has 5,000. Um, the one that has 5,000 citizens is going to be more powerful. Unless, you know, if you got some wise ones over there. So that's how it works. It could typically be about the number of people that's under Jezebel's control or the level, rank of people. So Jezebel gets her power. And I'm just saying her. But Jezebel gets her power through usurping the authority of people. And this is why I tell people when you start dealing with the Jezebel spirit, while you know, we can come, you can come up to me and you can bring Uncle Earl and you can say, Tiffany, uh, Uncle Earl, you know, there's this woman that got this this curse on him, this girl, she's a Jezebel spirit, or what have you. She this and she that. The thing about it is casting Jezebel out is ineffective if she doesn't want to be delivered. But two, the person who gets more in the in trouble with God. Is usually the person with the Ahab spirit because Jezebel would have no authority without Ahab. Mahalia, you're awesome. Thank you, sis. God bless you. Jezebel would have no authority without Ahab. So Jezebel usurps Ahab's authority. So when you relinquish your authority, when you relinquish your power, when you don't consult with God and you give your authority up, Jezebel is actually walking in your authority. Jezebel is doing, walking in your authority and that's what gets you in trouble with God. And that's why people, prophets and prophetic people, a lot of times you fall into a lot of uh, judgment. You get into trouble with God a lot because you have surrendered your authority uh, to that spirit, typically through sin, through idolatry. You've surrendered your authority uh, to somebody else. And while you're complaining about the narcissist, while you're complaining about them dominating you, manipulating you, controlling you, breaking you, you have relinquished your authority through idolatry. You didn't seek first the kingdom of God. So you've relinquished your authority to them through idolatry, which means you have legalized them in your life. And the more you legalize them, the more dominion you give over them, it can move from control to domination at some point. It can move from control to domination. And so some people who have a Jezebel spirit, it's easy to cast them out. This is why we start talking about narcissism. Uh, I've shared this before. A narcissist has a Jezebel spirit, but there's a difference between a person who's nar a narcissist versus a person who's narcissistic. Somebody who's narcissistic is not necessarily a narcissist, but they they are narcissistic, meaning they are narcissist-like. They have narcissistic traits. They are underdeveloped. They may even have the Jezebel spirit. That spirit is easily cast out. It's not if they if they start if they repent. If they sit back and they realize the error of their ways and they release, they release their Ahabs, they repent from controlling people or what have you, they will typically get free. But somebody who is a narcissist typically has narcissistic personality disorder. That is a high ranking Jezebel, which means that they have been turned over to a reprobate mind because they refuse to repent, which means they're not even they're not even aware of their error anymore. They are prideful. They're not going to see that. And so you're not going to cast Jezebel out of that person. It ain't coming out. It ain't coming out because that person is probably not even in most cases, not even say they have a reprobate mind. Um, but there are ranks to Jezebel, even between them two. There are ranks to that particular spirit. This is why I tell women a lot of times when, you know, you're doing deliverance or what have you, um, you have to release people. You got to forgive them because that's a form of trying to control another person. Unforgiveness makes you want to control the person you're mad at. And one of the ways you know that is because you start wanting them to fail. You want bad things to happen to them. And that's ungodly. That's ungodly. All right. What are the, some, some of the signs that you are under the control or witchcraft of another person? Number one, you're afraid to say no to that person because you know that the person will retaliate. You're afraid to say no. You should never fear saying no. Or you feel like if you say no, you got to go through a long list of excuses. No, because. No, because. And it's okay. You know, you can tell people no, because. But at the same time, you shouldn't do that from a place of fear. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do that from a place of fear. So I guess number one, you're afraid to say no to that person to a person um, that you because you know that the person will retaliate. Examples of retaliation include breakup, disassociating from you, uh, withholding affection, withholding time, money, resources, because they're gonna put you on punishment. 
you know what I realized I did? I went from number one to number three. All right, give me a second. Give me a second. I'm looking like, where am I? I see number three. Give me a second to renumber these guys so I don't be, I'm not confused. All right, and then we'll start on the next page. Okay. Uh oh. Okay. Number two. Signs that you are under the control or manipulation of another person. A person's love for you or acceptance of you comes with conditions. A person's love for you or acceptance. Like if, if, if me saying no makes you not want to affiliate with me, then you're not in my life for the right reason. That means that the person does not love you. It, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about immediately sex, for example. One of the first things you should do when you start talking to a person is, hey, I don't believe in sex outside of marriage. You should communicate that. A lot of people don't understand that because a lot of people have not been taught how to date. Communicate that. I don't believe in sex outside of marriage. Period. Point blank. Women ask me, when should I wait a month? No, because by that time, you probably formed a soul tie. You've already started forming something with the person. You've already got hope. You're hoped up. You hope deferred, make the heart sick. No, you tell them as soon as possible. First conversation, if possible. It depends on, because, you know, typically first conversations with a person can last anywhere between four to six hours. First conversations are typically very, you know, detailed or what have you. You know, you talk or what have you. And if the conversation goes in the area of sex, if the guy men mentions sex or something, he says, is there anything I should know about you? Well, I don't believe in sex outside of marriage. You have certain things that you, you talk about. Uh, yeah, no, no sex. No, nope. Then you gauge his response. So a person's love or acceptance of you comes with conditions. This is why some of you you started a sexual relationship, then you tried to withhold. And can I say something? I have to say this, and I hope that this is not taken the wrong way. Sometimes having sex with a person. And then suddenly stopping is your attempt to control the person. You should stop. You should have never started. And you should stop if you, if you, when you realize, hey, this is wrong, stop it. Because now it's rebellion, which is as a son of witchcraft. But sometimes people, you can fall into the trap, especially Christians are guilty of this. Having sex with a person to develop an appetite of that person for you. And then withholding and say, it's almost like a preview. Now. For $19.95, if for a ring, you can continue humping me, but now I feel guilty, so we can't do that no more. Am I saying that you should go back and sleep with that person? Not at all. I'm saying you should repent for fornication. I'm saying you should sit back and say, God, I repent. I will never do that again. I was outside of your will, Lord. I will never do that again. And then communicate with that person and then be willing to make that sacrifice. If he's going to walk out your life, let him go. Or if she's going to walk out your life, let him go. Thank you, Sister Brittany. God bless you. God bless you, sis. Let the person go. Stop trying to hold on to people. Sometimes manipulation looks like this. This is why I pull my lips off. Yeah, I tell people I, I, I made a commitment to God. I'm not kissing before marriage. I'm not kissing because a lot of women, a lot of men, what you do, those of you who claim to be abstinent, you play man games. It's, it's witchcraft. You like to kiss a dude, get him all aroused and tongue in him, get him all heated up, and then you pull it back. It's a sample. It's foreplay. If you'd like to continue, go try to read a book on Amazon, the view, the, 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 the preview. They give you a sample of the book and then you get to a certain spot and you get in there and it's good. And say, so if you'd like to continue, click here to purchase. And that's what a lot of people do is you get other people aroused. I want someone to arouse my intellect as well as my loins. You get people aroused rather than just sitting there and saying, let me let this person see who I am as a spirit. Because that's who the person is going to be communing with rather than me using my flesh. But it becomes manipulation because and typically when you have to do that, it's because that ain't the right man or that ain't the right woman. You know, good and well, that ain't the right person. They fleshly, they carnal. And you want to hold on to them because you see their potential. You see that imagination, that thought you got going on up in there. Right? You tease them. 
You get them, you, you gaslight them, you seduce them, you, you love bomb them, you do all of that stuff. Then you stick your tongue down his throat. You may play dry humping on the couch, but at the end of the day, once it's over with, said and done, you dust your halo off and try to put it back on your head. I don't believe in sex outside of marriage. Dude sitting there with a heart on. Am I saying you're supposed to go all the way? No, you shouldn't have got him hard, period. Because what you're doing is you're becoming like Amazon. You're like, to continue, press here. To continue, press here. Put the ring right here. And you know what? There are some guys out there that they can't get to that space. They get they like, man, that girl kiss. We grinded on the couch. It was so hot and juicy. And you'll get that ring, for real. And he'll take you down to Las Vegas and marry your tail. He'll do a quickie a wedding somewhere just to hump you. Because he doesn't take marriage seriously. Because he knows that I can divorce you. That's why you end up in that marriage. Now y'all in there fighting like cats and dogs. Because you didn't, he didn't hump you. He didn't got what he wanted. He didn't have fun with you. He didn't flip you over. He didn't have you in every position and everything in your house. Don't invite me to your house. I ain't sitting on your couch because y'all DNA everywhere. And he didn't did everything he could do to you. He has exhausted your skills. Now you over there trying to get download Kama Sutra books, trying to learn different positions because you can't satisfy a demon. They got the appetite of hell, but you don't know that because the world still got you thinking that well, I got to learn how to do a little bit more. I got to learn how to, I, you know, I got to learn. There's this choke slam method. There's this choke slam method. They said that's supposed to heighten the orgasm. So I'm going to choke slam him. They said, if you, you got to grab him. Sister Laura, God bless you. Thank you, sis. Grab by his Adam's apple and then slam him. Boom. And it, that what that's supposed to do is render him nearly unconscious. And what that's supposed to do is it makes him, it takes the control out. It makes everything. And this is not true. I'm just saying something silly, y'all. So don't nobody try this stuff. But you start believing that. And you go to doing some crazy stuff. Because you want that person to fall in love with you. Another word is you want them to fall under the spell. Now you're in a marriage and you done bought all the lingeries. You done bought every wig. You done bought every wig from the Tina Turner wig to the, the Nicki Minaj wig. You done bought every wig underneath the sun. You done bought wigs that make you look like dudes in the bedroom. You done done everything. And you come to realize your marriage is centered around sex. That man don't want to have a conversation with you. That man don't even like talking to you. He's not interested in you. He got what he came for. And you can't get mad. Now go Junior over there. <laughs> like we got a child together. He don't even care. He wanted sex in the first place. And you would have got rid of him if you had James 4, 7. Him submit yourself to God and resist the devil. And he will flee from you. But you didn't. You stuck your tongue down his throat. And you kept manipulating him. And you gave him a trial offer. And then you said, put it right here. And he said, okay. He got real curious. Okay. And then once his lust was satisfied, once his curiosity was satisfied, once he had ex done everything he could, once uh, mon monotonous, if that's the word, we're going to make it up. But once all of that entered and, and he had to deal with you standing up all the time, he decided, uh-uh, don't want this marriage no more. Don't want it no more. Now you got a broken heart. But you know the problem with it is even after the broken heart, you still didn't learn your lesson. You met another dude and you told him about the last dude. And he said, oh my gosh. And then the next thing you know, you did that to him. And so you said, I'm a Christian. I don't believe in our sex outside of marriage. He said, oh, me neither. Okay, I respect that. And then you stuck your tongue down his throat. And you got him all aroused. And you played games with him. Next thing you know, he's standing at the altar with you. Or at a courthouse or wherever. Now you you up and you didn't exhausted everything you learned on Pee Wee. Now you practicing it on Tyrone. And now he walk away. He get bored with you as well because you are a spirit. That's the eternal side of you. If you want something to last, you don't put you don't attach it to your flesh. If you want something that's gonna last, then you let the person get to know the spirit of you, and if the person get to know you as a person rather than getting to know your flesh. 
then that person can make a conscious, sober decision as to whether they want to be with you. But first, you want to make sure that they're safe, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, and that they are sober themselves. Because I've learned a lot of people don't know how to date soberly. And I am very sobering. I am very sober. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't have, I want the music playing in the background. I don't want none of that. I want to talk. I want to ask questions. I am a sobering person. I would attempt to sober. But the thing about it is, in my attempt to sober person, my goal is to say, hey, if you are accustomed to witchcraft relationships, just a little bit of a side note, if you are accustomed to those type of relationships, you get in a relationship with somebody who has to be on cloud nine, that you have to screw somebody that you have to take and y'all got to fall in love, that person is going to have an affair, period, point blank, period, 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 period. They're going to have an affair. And one of the reasons is because that is, when you get married, that's the most sobering thing that could ever happen to you. And in that marriage, what's going to happen is the person is going to get to know you. And it's, they're going to keep getting humble. They're not, they're not going to keep seeing who's in their head. Responsibility is going to enter in, but they have an addiction to that feeling that we call cloud nine, or you call being in love. They have an addiction to that feeling. And they'll get that feeling since they can't get it from you anymore. They'll likely get it from another person. It may not be something they intentional or something that they plan, but they'll meet another person and find themselves. It could be somebody on the job, find themselves starting to develop feelings because it has nothing to do with them not uh, wanting to be with you. It has everything to do with them being addicted to that feeling. They're addicted to that. There are so, there are so many people out here right now. They don't know nothing about love. They are addicted to lust. The oxytocin that comes with it. They are straight addicted to that. All right, let's move on. Number two, a person's love for you or acceptance of you comes with conditions. Number three, you're being mentally, emotionally, or physically abused. This is a sign of control. Domination, witchcraft, or control. You're being mentally, emotionally, or physically abused. And like I said, a lot of times it can come from a person who has a fantasy of, of who you could be or what they want you to be or what they want to extract from the relationship and when they're not getting that, a person can make a decision. I don't want to let you go, but I still want the benefit. And then consequently, they can become mentally, emotionally, or physically abusive. I was in an abusive marriage, and that was the way that worked, was that he had an idea of what he wanted. Um, not next, I won't say just for me. I think that what he wanted in a marriage. Um, and his, his idea of a marriage is what he saw with his parents. He wanted to have a woman that he wanted to he wanted to soar his royal oaks. He wanted to do what he wanted to do, but he didn't want to be left. He didn't want to be rejected. He didn't want to be abandoned. He dealt heavily with that. And so consequently, he had an idea that a wife should just accept it. It's not something he uh, it's not something that he expressed verbally, but it was something that he expressed in his action. But he had an idea. A woman should not leave. A woman should okay, be OK with that. And um, once he realized that I wasn't that type of woman, that I wasn't going to stick around. For that kind of stuff, that made, that sent him into a rage. Um, it sent him into a lot of anger or what have you. And consequently, he became really um, mentally and physically abusive, emotionally as well, abusive. But it was an, a bit, an, it was an attempt to control me, an attempt to control the human being because the person, again, on a prism, on a seesaw, already has this idea. And even in a case like that, you can be in a relationship with a person who is doing evil things like cheating and doing all kinds of crazy stuff but they're in this thing. They still have good intentions for you. And this is what makes them angry. This is how they are able to be on that seesaw, exalt themselves above you and be on this seesaw and get really angry with you for you rejecting them or threatening to reject them or doing things that shows that you're going to ultimately reject them. They can talk themselves into a rage because in that they look at the fact that they have good intentions for you. Like, I don't ever plan on leaving you. That's not good. You plan on cheating me. For, so that means you plan I, for the rest of my life. For the rest of my life, I'm supposed to be in a relationship being cheated on? No. But they genuinely have, I found, just dealing with, uh, just seeing uh, my dad and seeing a lot of guys, you know, my dad's cheating on my mom, all that. But seeing a lot of guys who cheat, the majority of men who cheat have no intention of leaving their wives. None, none whatsoever. Women, on the other hand, when a woman cheats, she is trying to trade her guy out. She is. Women typically, men and women are different when it comes to cheating. When a man cheats, he is normally just wanting to have sex with another person and wanting to engage in a feeling. Women, when women cheat, women are emotional creatures. We are the weaker vessel. So typically, when women cheat, we're looking to exchange a person or we could be looking for revenge. But 
we're looking to exchange the person for somebody better. Looking to exchange the person for somebody better. But abusive men, an abusive man, typically a lot of times, they a lot of times they're going to have the Jezebel spirit. And um, the goal is they have good intentions, but evil methods. And they're mad. Uh, they get really angry because they don't understand why you are the way that you are, why you're not sitting there. And why don't you stop talking about what they're doing? Why don't you just submit and surrender to it? Uh, they can get relatively frustrated with that. So that they can enrage themselves with their intentions. I found that most people who enrage themselves do so by looking at their intentions. This is a deception. Of, this is self-deception. Self-deception sets the stage for selfishness. 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 A Mississippi accent gets me all the time. But it sets the stage for selfishness. Um, when you're looking, self-deception is when you don't talk, when you don't question yourself, when you don't interrogate yourself, when you don't get therapy, when you don't get wise counsel, um, you will fall into the trap of self-deception. If you fall into the trap of self-deception, you get caught up in this prison where everything becomes about you. You start thinking of your good intentions and you will hurt a lot of people as a result. Um, and then you get really mad because you keep looking at your intentions. You'll keep saying, I didn't have bad intentions. And that's honest. You really didn't have bad intentions. If you're married and you're cheating on your wife or you're cheating on your husband, you probably had no intention of leaving the person. Your intention is to stay married to that person, to buy properties, have babies with that person. But you're also adding something else to the equation that the other person doesn't want, that the other person is saying, hey, this is not good. And you can get frustrated in the midst of it. Um, hey, Zeus, God bless you. Thank, thank you. God bless you. Email me. We're, we're setting up counseling sessions again. I'm going to have some with my students. So email um, support at anointedfire.com. Email support and admin at support at anointedfire.com. Support and admin at anointedfire.com. But again, it typically centers around solutions or not solutions, but intentions. Um, I found that that's the greatest deception is intentions. This is why I no longer say, well, I had good intentions for a person. Regardless of what, I have to always understand that the other person has needs, designs, desires, preferences, or what have you. And what has to happen is you have to communicate. You have to communicate. All right, let's move on. Another example is you're being forced to do something you don't want to do. You're being forced to do something you don't want to do. Somebody threatened to leave you, you know, if you don't have sex Somebody threatened to take your child from you. You know, you got children with him. Now he's threatening to take your children in, in child support court or what have you. Um, that somebody's forcing you to do something you don't want to do. Number five, you're regularly placed on punishment when you don't comply with the desires or demands of another person. You're regularly placed on punishment when you don't comply with the desires or the demands on, of another person. Uh, witchcraft, like, for example, putting people on punishment. A, a good example of that is when you suddenly see. this is what I one of the reasons I, I don't let everybody get close to me really fast is because I've learned a pattern of witchcraft and I hate it. And I found that it's common and I don't like it. And that is sometimes people get close to you. Like I said, they can use it as the soul tie as a noose, a whip. Um, they can use it as a leash um, or what have you. But a lot of times people form a connection with you and they create a pattern. Once they create the pattern, one of the ways to punish you is to simply stop the pattern. Is to simply stop the pattern. So, for example, you can have a, a friend. She calls you every day. Oh, let's go back to the relationship thing because I think that's easier. Um, if you're talking to a guy and you make it clear, let's say you, you messed up, you had sex with him, you shouldn't have done that, you were wrong, and you, you communicate with him. You say, hey, we can't do that no more or what have you. He says, sure. And then when he comes around you, you enforce that because it's easy to establish a boundary. Most people don't believe you. But when you enforce a boundary, that's when you start seeing people act out. So you enforce the boundary and you say, no, He's, he tries to kiss you. I can't even kiss you. No. I like you. I want to I want us to keep building our relationship. But, I, I you know, I just feel convicted. I really don't want to continue that. Honestly, I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. I, 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 messed, I messed up. I got in my flesh. I did something stupid. I let you come over to my house. We can't do that no more. He says, but we in a car now. Yes, yeah, still. We can't do nothing. There's no, I'm not going to get I'm not going to get you out. I'm not going to get you heated up or what have you. 
and I'm not going to try to get heated up. So you keep enforcing it. He tries to lean again. You enforce it. So he kind of put a little slick talk up in there. He says, yeah, y'all women. And that usually, you know, generalization usually say that is that precedes a breakup. Just so you know, when people start talking about that, that is form of control. It is the highest expression of uh, rejection or what have you, or generalization is the highest form of rejection, expression of rejection. So he sits back and he says, y'all women be tripping. You're falling into a category, which means he has an inability to distinguish you from a group of, of, of women. He has an inability, which means he's not the one. So anyhow, in that, you say, listen, let's just have fun, okay? You, we hanging out. I like hanging out with you. Let's have fun. He says, all right, cool. But you notice why you're hanging out with him, he's real dry. He's not his bubbly self. He's not doing all that. He says, I got to go home. You notice the tone in his voice. Yeah, I got to go home. I got to go home. I got to get up early. Okay. I'll call you. And he, he leaves in the kids. He goes, no, I forgot. I'm sorry. Then he get out. He go get in his car and he leave. You always get a text at 9 p.m. Good night, beautiful. Or are you up so we can talk? You don't get that text. But you figure, you know what? He said he was going home to go to sleep. I ain't going to trip. Next day, you always get a text in the morning at 8 o'clock. He, he has to be at work at 8. And while he's... Soon as he walks into the office, he always texts you as he's walking the clock in. It's always usually 7.55, between 7.55 and 8.02. I'm just making something up, guys. But he sends you a text. You don't get that text that morning. What that person is doing is using that pattern to control you. That's, that, that's witchcraft. That is a mastery of witchcraft, a mastery of manipulation. Meaning a person, this is something they've done before. And most times when people do it, they don't realize they have patterns. Every person has patterns. And this is why the Bible says there's safety in a multitude of counselors. You need to have people around you that see your patterns. That's a pattern of his. He didn't get what he wanted. So now he's, have, he's throwing a tantrum. He's throwing a tantrum. Now, you're sitting there. And what that can do, if you have a soul tie with him, and you probably had sex with him, so now you got a soul tie. Now you're feeling scared and you're feeling anxious. And that's the goal of it, right? So in that, you text him. You wake up, you know, you get dressed. 9.30, he still ain't text you. You text him. You say, so you're not going to text me? He doesn't say anything. So you go to work and you're dealing with anxiety at work. You go to work and you're just like, so no, he always, kept, can't, he always you know, call you on your lunch hour. All right, he going to call me on his lunch hour. I know he is. He doesn't. That's a pattern. The pattern is designed to get capture your attention to let you know that something is wrong without him having to directly communicate that with you that's what makes it witchcraft is the so in that you find yourself feeling anxiety you're like did i do something wrong so now the goal is now you got to figure it out you have the responsibility of going home is, well, you already know what you did you already know what you did well, what you didn't do so you get off work still no call or text so you call him again no answer no answer. You like, um, let's say his name's Jerome. Jerome, I don't know what's going on. Um, I hope everything is well your way. Uh, I haven't heard from you since yesterday. I give me a call back. He doesn't. Nine o'clock comes. You've been tortured all day. That feeling is designed to force you to give in to his dem demands. Can I say something? Can I say something? Can it be controversial? Can I use a word that's triggering? It's a form of rape. Because what it does is the person is removing your sobriety. The person is removing your sobriety. If you're smart, you'll go ahead and let them go. If you're wise, you're God-fearing, you'll go ahead and let them go. And that is designed to intoxicate you with fear. The fear of abandonment. It is to use your own demons, your own issues against you. So in that, you go to feeling like, dang. So now he doesn't call you all that night. You don't get a text, nothing. The next day, you wake up, there's no text. There's nothing. I just broke this ring. But you don't get a text. You don't get anything. 
you dealt with anxiety, you can't even function at work. You're confused at work. People are like you good. You're like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Right, silent treatment. Then all of a sudden, you get a text around eleven, uh, twelve. He says, hey, beautiful. Now you feel thankful and grateful. Y'all don't even realize it's a game. You feel gratitude. Oh my gosh. You say, oh, what happened to you? He says, uh, phone, lost my phone, or what have you. Always some, it's always some lie about the phone. Lost my phone, left it in the car, left it at my friend's house. It got, it fell in the water, wasn't working anymore. Screen broke and I couldn't see the dial the number, whatever. So now he says, can I see you tonight? You know why he's asking he see you tonight? Because he wants to see if the witchcraft worked. If the soul tie worked. If the yoke pulled you back in. So when you see him, 50 or 50% 50 or more of women will fall, will find themselves giving in. Because they never want to experience that feeling again. They never want to experience that feeling again. So when they get around him and he come in for the kiss, they say, and he says, and when they see him cut down like that, he come in and they're like, come on, why are you acting like that? He said, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just sorry. Oh man, it's getting late. So the woman just finds out. She just, then she leans in and kisses him. She leans in and kisses him. And then she lets the kissing go to another level or what have you. And then they sit in the car. He says, let's go to your place. And she gives in. God was trying to protect her from him. Your no is designed to protect you. But she didn't give in because you know what? That's what sin does. It'll make you feel that. It'll make you form that soul tie. And then the enemy uses that soul tie to control you. Okay. What was I? You're number five. You're regularly placed on punishment when you don't comply with the desires or demands of another person. Number six, you're past you're passively or indirectly told who you can associate with versus who you cannot associate with. You're, you're passively or indirectly told who you can associate with. And I think about friends. I think about, um, I've, I've had friends like this, what have you. And one of the things I, you know, I always laugh about this. I, I started laughing about this when I was in the world. I laugh about it, but I find it frustrating as well. Is I thank God for my personality, how God wired me. God wired me. He gave me a gift that he gave my mom. He wired me to be very, I'm a genuine sweetheart. I love people. That's just how I am. I love people. I want the best for everybody. I want everybody to be blessed. That's genuinely how I am. But because of the softness of my personality can be very deceptive. And what I mean by that is not me being intentionally deceiving. I mean that a lot of times people can think that I'm incredibly passive. Meaning she's scared. It, you know, I've had that happen. And a lot of times what that does, I found what that does is it makes people reveal because how you treat a passive person is really how you are. If you come across somebody you feel like is passive, how you treat them is really how you are because you are not afraid to show them because you feel like they're they're weak or what have you. However, I am a firm believer of boundaries. I am a firm believer of setting boundaries and mutual loving each other, all of that stuff. I'm a firm believer of all that. I can love you, but at the same time, I'm not going to sit there. And so I always said that's the deceptive part of my personality. Uh, it's not deceiving in a mean, meaning that I want to deceive people. It's deceiving because what it does is it, 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 it creates this illusion that, oh, she's scary and she's passive. And what it does, or what it's done in the past, is it's brought people into my life and they say, oh, I can control this girl. And then they start doing this stuff and what have you. And then they, when, I, when I sit up there, I'm like, excuse me, first and foremost, let's stop this. Or what have you. Then they're sitting there looking like, and then I found that people get frustrated. They get mad when they see that boundary because they wasn't expecting it. When you expect a boundary, it doesn't intimidate or infuriate you as much as one that you didn't expect to see. It, it infuriates you. And I realize, you know, I've come to realize that's how God wired me intentionally. He wired me intentionally so that I can see people where they are because I have this love. Some of you are wired that way. You have a love for people. Uh, you're a sweetheart. And you attract people who feel like, well, I can control you. 
I can dominate you. I can, I can, I can do whatever. But once they start coming in and they start trying to do that, and then you're like, ah, ah, they go this boundary. He, thank you, Sister Sarah. God bless you, sis. But here go this boundary. That's when a lot of times people get really, they don't just walk away from you. A lot of times they get really upset because in their mind, they feel like you deceived them. And I, I've realized a lot of times people feel deceived, but it's not you deceiving them. It's God hiding your gift behind your, I won't even say an illusion because this is really who you are, but he's hiding your gift. And most of the times when you come across a person who seems to be that soft, there's nothing back there but hollowness. But when you come across a person who is that genuinely soft, but when you push, you find that they're firm on the inside, you can feel deceived. You can feel deceived. But you're passively or indirectly told who you can associate with versus who you cannot associate with. So again, I think about friends. I've had friends like that. And um, I remember one friend in particular, and she told me, she was like, when you're talking to me, I don't appreciate you talking to somebody else. And I'm like, girl, who the heck? <laughs> and I had to, like, I had to let, let her see, like, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely not that person. I never have been in my whole wide life. I've always been nice, but I've never been that person that I'm gonna be like, oh, I don't want to lose you as a friend. I'm bye, bye. <laughs> oh, what have you? But sometimes it can be sowing a seed, like somebody come and tell you something about another person, and they say, girl. You know she dating such and such. Mm -hmm, she ain't no good. She this and she that. They'll tell you that, but what they're really telling you, this is indirectly saying you can't affiliate with her. I don't want you talking to her. Now, I could be a girl, let's say, for example, that go to the same school as you, a girl that um, work with you, what have you, and you're typically cool with her, but when they're telling you that, it's an indirect way of saying you are not allowed to affiliate with that girl anymore. They don't say it, but that's an indirect way of saying don't associate with this person. So now you go back to work and, you know, the next day you're in the lounge and you're talking to the girl the, uh, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the person that was talking to you, she see you talking to the girl. So now she's not speaking. You're now on punishment because you didn't get it. Controlling people always expect you to get it because they don't learn to communicate it. They expect you to catch on. You'll figure out why I'm mad. You'll figure out why I'm doing this. I said, I've seen that a lot. I've had, I've had a couple of cases with, I've had friends that have tried that with me. And um, they sat back and said, okay, you know, such and such and such, you know. Um, girl, I don't like it when you have other friends. Or, you know, don't bring your other friends around me. And I'm like, girl, I'm going to have other friends. Don't play that with me. I am not your man. I'm not your boo thing. Right? I'm not having an affair. We are friends. We are friends. But there's some, it, it is a, a sign of control. It is a sign of control. You're told who you can associate with versus who you cannot associate with. You're told who you can associate with or who you cannot associate with. Girl, you can't be around. You know, I, I, don't, I just don't fool with broke, broke folk. I'm, you hear what I'm saying? Girl, I hear you. I'm, I am see, because, you know, broke folks, they, I feel you. And then you over there and you start talking to somebody who's broke. And now she stopped talking to you. Hmm. It's control. It's you you get put on punishment. It's designed to bring you back under submission. Uh, number seven, you're not allowed to either prosper or fail. I'm gonna explain it, no worries. You're not allowed to either prosper or fail. And typically this is in friendships. Um, so when I say prosper, some friends don't mind you having something, but they just want to have it first. You're not allowed to prosper. Sometimes they don't want you to have it at all. They want you to always be under them because that's their view of you. That's how they perceive you. You're not allowed to prosper. And when I think about that, I think of friendships. I think of friends who uh, will sit back and if you get something, they will say, they promoted you. I think about when I got promoted, I, uh, a company I had started working at. Well, at and I can be honest. I started working at at and and I got promoted to supervisor. And I had women approaching me talking about something. You took that position. They asked me to. Hmm. I wouldn't have took it. it they just overwork you. They, they, they. But the reality of it was, was because I had only been there a year. And they had been there for a long, long, long time. 
some of them more than a decade. They felt entitled. They felt entitled. I've learned that entitlement is one of the worst forms of control out there. Entitlement and jealousy, I hate it. I hate it with an undying passion. Because a person feels like seniority should always um, overrule skill, anointing. It's not always the case. But you're not allowed to prosper. Again, I think about friends. I think about coworkers when I think about that. You know, people who feel like you should not go past them. You need to stay at this certain. You're put on punishment if you prosper or you're not allowed to fail. And when I think about fails, I think about parents. I think about some parents and it's not always love. And I think going back to the example of, you know, um, a child saying, hey, I want to do this. And the parents say, no, you ain't doing it. They don't make enough money. It's OK to encourage your children to, to, to want something better for themselves. But one thing you never want to do is you never want to castrate their vision. Because then you can end up with a child that sits at home and plays video games. You never want to castrate their vision. You want to always encourage them. Sometimes, they, you know, we prophesy in part. Sometimes they only see a part of the vision. You have a little boy that says, I want to be a gamer when I grow up. You're like, oh, no. Nah. Oh, what have you? I know gamers can make money, but you know, hey, that ain't what I want for my kid. You know, I want my kid to do something. But at the same time, you have to always partner with the child's gifting. Partner with the child's gifting. That means, you know, help the child to see more of who he or she is if you have insight. And you can do that by buying uh, different things for the child. If you feel like the child is just grace to build systems or what have you, the child is maybe apostolic. You buy systems for the child. You find different ways to help the child to utilize their gifting because typically we find something that we're good at. And a lot of times we lock ourselves into it and we think that's what we're supposed to do. But a lot of times what happens is a parent instead will begin to castrate the child or will begin to castrate the child's vision. It ain't gonna make you no money. You want to be an actor? Oh, one of those broke starving actors in Hollywood, rather than understanding that is just a part of what the child sees. The child may be something even greater. The child may be the next Tyler Perry. You don't know. All right. Number eight, the perpen weaponizes humiliation to bring you under subjection. The person weaponizes humiliation to bring you under subjection. So I think about, I always think about friends. I always think about friends. I think about this time where, um, I was hanging out with, um, I'll just say a friend of mine. I was hanging out with a friend of mine and we were at a hotel, was not saved, okay? We're at a hotel with my boyfriend and his brother, my bo my then boyfriend and his brother, no sex, none of that. We were just hanging out because he was living in a hotel because he didn't, he was not from Mississippi. And we were in the hotel, we were hanging out, we were eating pizza and um, a monkey came on the television set playing the drums. And she said, ha ha, look at Tiffany. And I tried to ignore her. everybody. I, I, I saw the guy was there. He, he ignored her. I saw her boyfriend. You know, they, they, I saw the expression. They were trying to ignore her. And I know that. I know how I know how some sisters can be. I was like, okay. I gave her a look. Like, don't do that because that ain't what we normally do. You know, I can see if we joke like that, we don't joke like that. Don't do that. She says it again. Ha ha, look at Tiffany. One of the guys go, dang, or something. And I'll say, hey, let me talk to you outside right quick. And I took her outside and I said, listen, let me tell you something. I said, what's up with that? And she was like, what do you mean? I said, what's up with that? Cause you don't normally do that with me. We don't, we don't, we don't clown on each other like that. We don't cut it, cut at each other. What's up with that? I was just, I said, you don't joke with me like that. Well, I'm sorry. I said, no, I'm just trying to make sure you're good because at the end of the day, that ain't how we play. Because if I come back for you and I told her I'm a master of words, if I come back for you, you're going to be shame up in there. Do you going to want to fight? So I'm just, I'm just giving you a warning shot. Don't do that. Don't do that. But they will weaponize humiliation. And, you know, you can sit back and say, well, what was the goal in that? A lot of times in that particular case, it was competition. 
it was competition. The goal was to try to make you look a certain way. That's a form of control. It's to control another person's perspective of you. It's to control another person's perspective of you. It's to get people to see you the way that they want to, they want you to be seen. It's to get people to see you the way they want you to be seen. And you always, in a case like that, you always have, I always give a person a, a warning shot and a look. The second shot may be a conversation. Hey, let's talk right quick. The third one, I will come for their throat. I come for their throat. I show them how it feels to be humiliated. I used to. I'm not going to say I do that now. I don't know. I don't hang around those type of people now, but I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And so it's a good system. You know, give a person a look. Let them know it's not okay. And then two, you take them outside. Hey, let me talk to you right quick. But humiliation, people weaponize humiliation in an attempt. And typically this is designed to control another person's perspective of you. It can be something they say out loud in front of you. Or it can be something they say behind your back. But it's people trying to control another person's pers other people's perspective perspective of you. Number nine, you're constantly criticized for your choices. You're constantly criticized for your choices. You sit back and say, um, let somebody why you wear those shoes? Because I wanted them. You didn't even do your hair. You dating him. Criticism can be direct or it can be implied, but it can be indirect. It can be just a person using their facial expressions uh, to communicate to, with you, to communicate with you. But you're constantly criticized for your choices. Constantly criticized. criticized. It's almost like you can never do anything right. Everything you do seems to be wrong. You get around a person like that, remove yourself, remove your foot from that situation. Number 10, you're constantly gaslit. Person makes you feel, question your reality. Hey, sis, why were you acting like that? What did I do? Did I do something wrong? What are you talking about? You tried to humiliate me up in there. No, I didn't. You did. I think you deal with rejection. That's what I think this is. That's gaslighting. That's gaslighting. The person knows. She knows what she did, but she will make you question your sanity or your reality. I think a better example is that typically happens in romantic relationships. You know, hey, uh, who is that? Who's that calling your phone at three in the morning? You talking about calling my phone? Somebody was calling your phone at three in the morning. And I saw. I saw you look at the phone. I'm talking about. Oh, some miss calling me to see your phone. Well, I gotta see. See that you don't. That's what I'm talking about. That you, you, your insecurities. No, I trust what you've done in the past. You've cheated in the past, so I trust that. I don't trust that you're a good guy. I can't trust that right now. And you got to show me that. And so, at the end of the day, I asked you when you did that. Did you want to go ahead and end this relationship? You said no. You want to work it out. Well, part of working it out is building trust again. Sorry to help. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm not going to be on a losing end of that. Okay. No, no. See, this is what I'm talking about. You can go ahead and go on about your business. Okay. Because I ain't got time for this. Ah, da, da, da. You see that the person is gaslighting. The person is gaslighting. They're going to make you feel like you're crazy. They're going to make you feel like there's something wrong with you. They're going to make you feel like you, you're doing something wrong uh, because the objective is to get you to stop questioning. At, oh, what happened? All right. I got to renumber these. 11, 12, 13. Because if I don't, I'm going to say it wrong and somebody going to be like, hey, I thought we were on this number. All right. No words, guys. Said I was going to move fast. I haven't been moving fast. I got to move a little bit faster. Okay. All right. We're almost done. I didn't realize we were almost done. I actually thought we had more pages, but I've already skipped, skipped those. Okay. Number 11, person makes decisions on your behalf. This is a form of uh, domination. This is a form of domination when people make decisions on your behalf. People make decisions on your behalf. You need to go to the store. Oh, she'll take you. Hey, girl. Uh, I need. I need seven hundred dollars cash at me. They make decisions on your behalf. 
Now, there are, you can suggest, you can ask questions or what have you, but person makes decisions on your behalf. That is a form of domination. Number 12, person is overprotective of you. I love it when I say something and make you say, wait, hold up, wait. Person is overprotective of you. This is usually competition disguising itself as love. Most of the time when you come across people who say that they're overprotective, they have a, they have a measure of control. Meaning they feel like you are insufficient, you're deficient, you are delinquent in a certain area. And so they feel like they have to uh, control that area or be the wall around your heart in that particular area. Well, honestly, what that means is typically, no, you are not, uh, Kayla, you're not blocked, I see you. But um, typically what that means is they are extracting benefits from that area and they don't want anybody else extracting benefits from that area. So they may point out that you are softy in this area or what have you but at the same time they are benefiting from the area of your life does that make any sense they're benefiting from that area of your life so it could be a friend for example that's constantly getting money out of you constantly borrowing money and all that and she just said you're just too nice and you know you you say girl my sister called me she asked me for seven hundred dollars she said uh-uh you ain't gonna give it to her uh, -uh. I i'll call her back for you because your sister always doing it your sister always doing it. I don't know why she do that. Your sister always doing it. But she's doing it because she's extracting money from you in the area. So she comes off as overprotective, but she's not. She's guarding what she believes to be hers. All right. Number 13, you're isolated from others or from certain people. You're isolated from others, controlling people. Typically, I think about narcissists when I think about this. A narcissist will isolate you from anybody who loves you, anybody who's beneficial. For you. The Bible says there's safety in a the multitude of counselors. They will isolate you from your counselors. And they don't have to tell you, get rid of them, I'm, I'm, I'm dumping you. Typically, they just put you on punishment for associating with certain people. They just keep putting you on punishment. They keep putting you on punishment and you start dealing with the threat or the anxiety of losing them, or if you're living in a house with them, one of the things that they do is they just change the temperature of the house. They change the environment. And a lot of us, if you're a profit or profit person, you are incredibly sens sensitive to environments. And so an environment, when you go into it, they just simply shut off the love or what you feel like is a love. They shut off the, what some people would say, good, good vibes. And of course, I don't believe in all that, but I'm saying they shut off all of that. They shut off the patterns. And so now you're uncomfortable. You're, you're uncomfortable and you want things to go back to normal and you will do anything. And typically you're able to survive that for a day. You're able to survive that for two days. You may even be able to survive that for a week. But when that thing starts moving into week two, week three, week three, week four, you are dealing with somebody that not only has a Leviathan spirit, but that because they got a strong sense of pride, but the person has a strong spirit of witchcraft. You are on punishment and that person will take you a month all the way to the voice court. They would much rather lose you than to lose what they feel like they want from you. Then a compromise. You're isolated from others or from certain people. Why you go to that church? That's your pastor. Mm. He was at the church late. Mm. I bet you that. Mm -hmm. It's to make you feel like I got to prove that. No, I just go to church. I'm I'm volunteering. I'm serving. Well, I, I had to be there late. Oh, what have you? And then you constantly get put on punishment every Sunday or every Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, whenever y'all have uh, Bible study, you're constantly put on punishment. To the point where you no longer want to deal with that anxiety. So, Sister Allison, God bless you. Thank you, sis. You no longer want to deal with that anxiety. You don't ever want to feel that again. So, you know what you do? You don't go to church. You miss church and you realize things are good today. Because typically when you're dealing with somebody who's a narcissist, they reward you that day. That one Sunday you don't go, you get rewarded. That one Sunday you don't go, you get rewarded. And that reward is going to look like, hey, you want to go out to eat? He's going to be nice. He's going to be kind. 
He'll be all of those things. So you start noticing the bipolar dynamic of either I go and I deal with the extremity of a fight and he's going to take it all the way there. Like it's going to be a major fight. Like he'll go and he won't come home. He will have me anxiety and anxiety all night or he will highly reward me. Like he's going to take me out to eat. We're going to go to the park. We will hold hands. He open up to me. He talked to me. Then we go home and we have a romantic night. You deal with the extremity of it. It's typically no middle. It's the extremity. I, I tell people I love having been in abusive situations and growing up in that because one thing I learned is that I, I can I know control when I see it. It's an extremity. It's a science to me now. It's an extremity. You are it goes from hot to cold. And so now you start realizing I want to go to church. But dang it. I don't think I'm I don't think I'm mentally equipped. And just a little bit of revelation, because somebody needs to hear this. When you're with somebody like that, Saturday night, the punishment starts. It's to give you a preview of what's going to happen if you go to church tomorrow. Saturday night. The punishment starts. Yeah, I think I'm going to go hang out with uh, Tyrone and tomorrow. Tyrone, why would you go hang out with Tyrone? Tyrone I told you, you know that, that dude ain't no good to do out here selling drugs. The man have a house full of women. And I think he a pimp. Why would you go over there? I mean, I, 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 he ain't a good person, but dang, he cool. You gonna be at church? What you think I'm gonna do? What you want me to do right now? Come to church with me. I ain't going to that church, man. I ain't going to that church. That's the punishment. That's the threat. If you go to church, I'm going to go to a place that I can potentially get arrested, killed, or cheat on you. You're going to go to a place, and it's going to be your fault. My blood will be on your hands, or my semen going to be on somebody else. Either way it go, your fault. You go to church. So the night before, you are already taken to that space where you're left to think about it, to agonize over it. And it actually works over a period of time. So a lot of people, I'm going to say it, not everybody, but a lot of people who claim to have church hurt, they don't have church hurt. They left the church for a man or a woman. They just had to find an accusation against the church to justify it because they didn't want to tell nobody that they left because somebody was at the house punishing them. All right. Number 14, your boundaries are rarely, if ever, regarded. Your boundaries are rarely, if ever, regarded. You communicate a boundary. Hey, don't call me past nine. You call yourself day to do. Next thing you know, 904. You know, can I, I can say this. I've learned the spirit of rebellion is real strong in America. Really. When I tell you it's very strong. Because I've learned this through uh, just running a bunch of programs. I remember catching on to this years ago. Um, when, I, when I first started my Remnant Writers program, and I would give the students like a week to write so many pages. And if they didn't write, they had to set, submit it in on a particular day by before 12 a.m. By 11.59, they had to submit it in. Otherwise, they would have a fee. And I got a chance, not even just that. I saw that in my business, but I got a chance going back to Remnant Writers. The student, I, I had some students, it was a pattern. They had a spirit of rebellion. It was a pattern of theirs. It was a habit that they will always wait to the last minute. When you wait to the last minute, it's typically, typically not you just working under pressure. No, you work better with the spirit of rebellion. That's the spirit of rebellion. Last minute people, procrastinators, you're typically fooling with the spirit of rebellion. You wait, you walk around with the spirit of rebellion. So you, you rebel against your assignment. Anything that's given to you, you lose interest in it because you almost feel like you're being controlled. Is wait, you wait till the last minute. So what they would do is they would try to submit it at 859. They would try to submit it at 859 or they'll wait to 1203, 1204, and I'll get an email from them. Hey, I'm trying to submit it, but it won't go through. Why'd you wait? You got to pay the full. But no, I tried to submit it at 12. It was 1159, but I keep trying and it won't go through. It was a pattern. And I said, no, you're going to pay the late fee because you keep waiting till the last minute. Why are you trying to submit something at 1150 something? 
Why are you trying? Why didn't you do? I, I've given you a pattern. I've given you a structure. I've given you a system that works. Why are you trying to submit it at the last minute? It's a spirit. Of, it's a spirit of rebellion. Your boundaries are rarely, if ever, regarded. And when I was talking about business, I noticed that my I, clients that do that. Man, I love being in business. I really do. I, I re, I've learned a lot. I have worked with over a thousand ministries. I have learned a lot in my years of doing business. I have learned a lot in my years of doing business. And I've learned, I could, you know, I could tell a client, hey, you get one free revision with the package you've chosen. And people will try you. And one of my uh favorite but not really my favorite but most annoying uh, games that people play is when they call me and they say hey um i need a, a revision i need could you change the ribbon and could you do this and i said ma'am you have to fill out the form i submit i submitted the form to you you get one free revision because what they're trying to do is get around the process they don't want to go through the process because if they say it over the phone then they can say well i didn't submit a revision no you you have to go fill out that form I got to fill out. You can't take it. over, No, ma'am. You have to go fill out the form. Some of my greatest arguments in business have been me telling people to go back and fill out a form. And when I say arguments, I'm talking about people getting real loud and acting out. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not at home right now. When you get home, go submit that form. You can't put. No, ma'am. Can you submit the form for me? No, ma'am. Because then it can get lost in translation. You'll tell me you'll say I told you this. And you didn't really tell me that you have to submit the form yourself. You want a revision? You have to submit the form yourself. I, I will. One of the greatest arguments, most memorable arguments, and I'm not going to go there, was between three people on the phone at one time. I have never been gaslit to that level. And I've worked with over a thousand ministries. This happened maybe, mm, it was in his house. So I would say maybe 2016. What, 2000? I think it was 2016. And I had a guy to place an order for a logo. They already had it. They wanted me to reproduce it. And I did it. And I have never been that gaslit. I have never had somebody to act that way in my whole wild life. And I've done business with a lot of a lot of, of, of not so mentally sound people. The man got on the phone. It was, I don't want to go into um, ministry titles, but I remember I'll, I'll say this guy was a pastor his bishop, and they had the secretary all on three-way calling me screaming, like at the top of their lungs. And I said, you cannot submit a revision request over the phone. I did let him do one thing when he was submitting something he told me mar maroon. And when I did it, when they called me back and they were like, uh, could you change the color? And could you change this? I was like, no, um, you have to fill out the form and you have the revision because you already got your free revision. Well, and I remember the bishop said, I didn't say maroon. I said salmon. I said, well, no, the guy that you submit, the, the, the pastor, he told me maroon. I did not say that. I said, sir, yes, you did. Now, that's not to say everybody, every leader is like that because they're not. There are some amazing leaders out there. But I'm just saying that in this particular case, I work with ministries. My, I work, I have a selling logo company. And um, we went through a process. I'm telling you, I had to find, I had to say, I said, listen, I said, I don't know who you think you're talking to. You guys can't intimidate me. You can call me three way, six way. I don't care how you do it. But at the end of the day, you're not going to intimidate me. You're going to follow the rules. This is as simple as that. You fill out the form because they kept calling and saying, okay, we need another change. No, you fill out the form, but it's trying to make me pay. I know, but you didn't do No, I did exactly what you asked. I did exactly. And it looks good. I did what you asked. And when they kept calling, I said, no, that's not how I do business. I'm not, I won't do business like that. And typically in cases like that, if you're going to be in business, you have to be mindful that you're not desperate for money because not all money is good money because people hold money over your head. If you're desperate for it, people will control you with it. They will control you with it. They're like, right, well, give me my money back. Listen, you ain't said nothing but a word. You ain't said nothing but a word. If I haven't given you the product, you ain't said nothing but a word. But if I put work in, no. Period. No. No, but I can say the end of that, the way that that ended, it was a constant. I had never had like 300 calls. I ain't going to say it was 300, but I'm just saying it was a lot of calls. Of, of, and to the point I had to block them. And I'm, I sent them an email. I was like, I told them on the phone. I said, listen, 
you're not going to you're not calling me anymore. You're not allowed to call me. You're going to go to the form. You're going to fill out that form. You're going to follow the instructions just like everybody else. Period. Point blank. I said, that's how this is going to happen. I said, this is how this is going to end. You're going to follow the instructions. Am I going to give you a refund? No, I've already put too much time into this order. No, you're going to follow the instructions. And then we're going to we're going to come. If you need a revision, you're going to pay for the revision. You're going to do just like everybody else has to do their places in order here. You're going to comply. And I said, and you call my phone, but you're not allowed to call my phone. I am blocking every last one of you. And I did. I blocked them. And I kept getting emails and stuff and what have you. And it was it was a whole mess and a half. But finally, completed the order. Had to deal with some stuff uh, from behind that. But a couple of years later, I remember that, that, that pastor reached out to me. He was like, hey, uh, do you remember me? I was like, no, I've worked with a lot of leaders. I've worked with a lot of people. He was like, um, this is the name of the ministry. And I was like, that sounds for me. And I went, pulled it up and he was like, he said, okay, first I just want to say, th uh, I apologize. He said, we did. He said, the way we behaved was not good. I was like, it was just a bellic. <laughs> but he was like, um, they needed me to resend the logo to him because they had lost it. Yeah, that's okay. I sent it. I said, okay, I sent it. But your boundaries are rarely, if ever, regarded. When people want to get past your boundaries, they will use every method. You have to always enforce your boundaries at whatever threat of loss that comes with enforcing those boundaries. You know, I would much rather lose a person than to lose my boundaries, unless my boundaries are unrealistic, right? Uh, but I would much, I would never, uh, I would never host a person in my life that does not regard my boundaries, because that tells me the person does not regard me, or we're in this effect. The person exalts himself and sees me as here. All right, let me move on. I'm trying to get you guys out of here. I'm trying to get you guys out of here. All right, number fifteen: scheduled conflict when you have plans. Scheduled conflict when you have plans. Constantly having to block this love chat person. Scheduled conflict when you have plans. That means that a person will repeatedly schedule a conflict. I think about married couples. I think about relationships or what have you, where a person will schedule like every Friday night or every time you get ready to do something, a person will schedule a conflict, meaning they'll start a fight up. Um, that's control. They'll start a fight up or they'll act like they got something to do. They know that you're going to be doing this then all of a sudden they need to do that um, in an attempt to stop you from doing what you're supposed to be doing. Schedule conflict when you have plans. Number 16, we got 19, it's been 20, but I misnumbered it. We almost done. Number 16, use of past relationships to portray themselves as the victim when they don't get their way. Use of, use of past relationships to portray themselves as the victim when they don't get their way. So, um, romantic relationships, you know, typically I immediately think of a man saying, you know, when he don't get his way after he didn't fought with you, left the house, stormed out, screamed at you, all of this stuff. And then when he realizes that you're still going to stand your ground, even at the risk of losing him, typically it's like almost, it's the, it's the, the it's not the last resort. It's the resort before the last resort, if that makes sense. Uh, the last resort typically can become physical abuse, but that particular time you'll see that all of a sudden this manifestation of man and i loved you man it's like this with every woman i can i try to get with he cast himself as a victim you know all my relationships and you know so i know you about to leave me why ain't nobody said nothing about leaving you i just said no i said no that's not okay i said no your ex-girlfriend can't come over here no, I don't want you talking to your ex-girlfriend. That is not an option. And I don't care how many tantrums you throw. That is not genuinely, wholeheartedly. It's really not an option. You can throw 365 tantrums. You can leave me. You can dog me out. I don't care. At the end of the day, that is not an, that is not an option. That is not an option. See, that just makes me think about my ex-girlfriend, how she tried to control. Ain't nobody trying to control you. I'm saying that that's not an option. You get to make the decision. You, I can't control you, right? I can't tell you what you can and cannot do. You get to make that decision yourself. But what I can do is remove myself from the equation. That's not control. That's me saying cause and effect. That's not okay. Talking to your ex? No. No. 
You got no kids with her. There's no reason for her. But I'm just trying to, you know, help her out with her situation. No. See, I knew you were gonna you were gonna walk away. I didn't say I was gonna walk away. I said that's not an option. Why did why does that have to precede the benediction? You all you have to say is okay. I respect that because I wouldn't want you talking to your ex. Why can't you say that? Why can't you just be like okay? Why does it have to go into this? Right, Kanavi. Why does it have to go into this? And so the use, the use of past relationships. So a lot of times they'll break up an ex-girlfriend. They probably um, bought up before to you and they'll just keep using that ex-girlfriend's name. Yeah, and I said, like when I, was, I told you about Tamika, that's how Tamika used to do me. I'm starting to think that Tamika wasn't the problem. See, there you go. I mean, I just... They will betray themselves as a victim to get what they want. Like I said, that's usually the step before the last resort. That's usually right before that precedes abuse. That usually is going to precede physical abuse because when the person sees that that doesn't work, um, that's usually their last step and they don't have anything else. And sometimes they can become, not everybody, but some people can become physically abusive. Uh, number 17, using the blame game. I said blame. Uh, using the blame game or using deflection. Using the blame game, this is control, is bringing up something you did in the past. That's the blame game. Or po pointing out an insufficiency or a deficiency in your life. It's not like you. It's not like you got yourself together. Shoot, you, how, how, many, how many kids you got? You got four. So yeah, I got another girl pregnant. And this didn't happen to me, guys. I'm not, this is not my story. This is just me being creative. So, I mean, I messed up, but I always did want a, a son. I want my own blood son. It's the blame game. Or typically finding something that you did wrong, something you did wrong in a relationship. It can be stuff from years ago. Sometimes it could be just them taking something and and and, and all of a sudden, um, magnifying it, blowing it up, some, blowing it out of proportion. It could be, for example, you woke up that morning and you weren't speaking. It wasn't a good thing, but you weren't speaking because you were frustrated about the argument the night before. So you weren't speaking. So then he used the blame game. I mean, that's why I did what I did because, man, you know, I felt bad. You had me feeling like less than a man or deflection. And that's when people take their own issue and deflect it onto you. And I found that that is a, that is a mastery when, especially when you're dealing with, with a three way. And when I say a three way, don't think a romantic relationship. But typically, if you have a, a Jezebelic system, like with any time three people are involved in something, it becomes more of a system than anything. Um, and it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. It could be it could be a romantic relationship and a mother in law involving herself or somebody. Anytime you have that that dynamic, it becomes more of a system and deflection i found like in a jezebel thing people who have a jezebel spirit will typically cast their character onto you and then it's almost like they will take on your thing it's a it's it's mastery at best uh but well it's a form of mastery they are very good at like if the per the person who they're controlling will start to see you the way the other person really is and start to see the other person with the way that you are there's somebody on here that can relate, that know what I'm talking about. But they can sit up there and say, see, the problem with you, and they're talking, you like, no, Negro, that's your, that's how your mama is. How, you, how did you do that? Right, projecting. How, how did you do that? But my mom, she nice, and she fighting for our relationship. No, that woman been trying, ooh, Dude, the person is under a spell. Spells are words. That means that he's had intimate conversations with his mother. He's given his mother a level of intimacy that he is not giving to you. Consequently, his mother has more access. He's cleaving to his mother. 
his mother has more access, so she has more influence. So he's under the influence, which is a form of witchcraft. So there's nothing that you can say because right now he's under the influence, which is why, you know, like I said, he typically used deflection. So when I think about that, when I think about a three-way dynamic, number 18, hurting and then saving you, savior complex. This is a form of control. So we talked about earlier, the guy that all of a sudden, you know, he's punishing you because you wouldn't have sex with him. And you stop kissing him and all that. So he puts you on punishment. He stops calling you, right? He stops calling you. And then all of a sudden he resurfaces. He saves you. He saves you from all that agony that you've been feeling for the last couple of days. All that, all that fear, all that scared, all of that. He shows up and, he, and then you, you're like, oh, and he comes around. You, you're like, no, I can't believe you. And he said, baby, 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 baby calm down, baby, calm down. No, no, you did that to me. You, I can't believe you said that. And you, you, you did that. And, and I'm just, I can't believe that. I can't believe you did that. And he says, listen, I'm sorry for making you feel like that. I'm sorry. I know I, I, I'm not the best person in the world. I hurt you. And I, I get it. That's okay. Maybe one or two times because somebody can do something wrong to you and really be sorrowful. Be really be sorrowful. But when you see that pattern, that is a narcissistic tendency. It is a wile of the devil. It is to hurt you and then to save you. It is to hurt you and then to save you. To hurt you and then to save you. It can put you on punishment. Like if you're living in a house with a person like that, they can put you on punishment for three weeks. Because like I said, typically we can deal with a fight. We can deal with a, dis on, a, a disagreement, a few days or what have you. That's what you expect most disagreement. It's the same thing um, that we think with storms. Most of the time, we you know we think of a storm. We think of it in just a few days, maybe a week, and then it goes away. But over the course of time, if that storm lasts a long time, we can actually start m manifesting what's in us, you know, or what have you. That's why God will allow some storms to last for a long time. It's because what's in you comes out. Yeah, Apostle Hopkins is awesome. But what's in you starts to surface in the middle of that storm. So if you're suicidal, if you got an antichrist spirit, it starts to surface because when God doesn't allow that to lift, but this is this is what people do in relationships as well. They will hurt you for a long period of time. It becomes a pattern of being hurt by that person, a pattern a pattern of him coming home and not greeting you and not speaking or acting. A certain, it becomes a pattern uh, of him uh, maybe not coming home for the night. It becomes a pattern or a pattern of, of, of silent treatment. It becomes a pattern until it, it starts to put you in this space of when is this going to end? Because you're tired of going to work and feeling like that. You're tired of going, you can't function. You can't do your, your work. Right, so clap on, clap off. But you can't function. You can't do your work. And it, it's designed to make you say, it's, it's designed to break you. And that thing can get so, it can get so bad. I remember with me, I don't even like talking about this stuff, but I have to give the example. And I'm almost done, guys, but still, like and share. I remember with me, I literally... When I was in, when I got to that place in a marriage, I started lose, I started having these involuntary jerks in my hand. I literally, I remember that. I remember knowing that I was breaking. I, I was breaking because I could, I would be typing and my hand would do this right here. My hand, and I kept losing control and I, and I would grab my, I remember grabbing my arm and crying like, um, I, I could feel myself breaking down. I was I was breaking because that's what control does to you because the enemy is usurping your authority. Is usurping your authority. But they'll hurt you. They could put you on punishment for three weeks and then all of a sudden come home with roses. At this time, you are so broken. You are so desperate for peace. You are so desperate for normality. You are so desperate. And then when they come back with the roses, you're like, no, no, no. And just come over there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But what it does is it, it makes the soul tie tighter. Because now you are afraid of losing him. You are tormented by what you felt. You're tormented by it. It's a form of control. Last one, number 19. 19. This is for relationships, romantic relationships. The person threatens to cheat on you, divorce you, expose you, or to destroy something that's valuable to you. And that can be indirectly or indirectly. That can be directly or indirectly. 
They threaten to cheat on you, divorce you, expose you, or destroy something that's valuable to you. And the valuable thing could be the relationship, but they threaten to cheat on you. I'm go, nah, you keep this up, I'm going to go sleep with somebody else. I'm going to go sleep with somebody else. Now, I don't, know, I don't even know if I want to be here no more. I, I don't know if I could take this anymore. Expose you. It'd be something you did, something you said. I, I should tell such and such what you did. If you married, you, you be careful because, you know, them sex tapes get leaked. Huh? Or destroy something that's valuable to you. Maybe it could be a relationship. Your relationship with them, anything. They threaten to cheat on you, divorce you, expose you, or destroy something valuable to you. I remember when I dealt with a Jezebel. First time I knowingly, that's the first time I actually ever heard the word Jezebel. Um, a lady said to me, I will expose you. And I'm thinking to myself, Expo I've literally never told this woman nothing, ever. Every conversation we have ever had has been godly. Like, I won't say godly. I will say I was godly. I talked about God and never said anything. But I watched the video. Some my uh, this guy that was mentoring me and a girl that was a close friend of mine at the time. They told me they said watch spirit, watch videos on Jezebel. And I had I didn't know Christians could have demons at that time. And I watched the, this video and the guy who used that. He said they always threaten to expose you. And when I tell you it freaked me out, she was like, "I will expose you." And I was like, "Expose what?" You know nothing about me. I'm telling you this. You should never be in a space where you feel like you need to expose another human being. I'm going to put out there. Don't nobody date such and such, such and such, because he is this, 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 this. You're trying to control the perspective of another person. This is the last one. They threaten to cheat on you, divorce you, expose you, or destroy something that's valuable to you. I'm going to say this in closing. Control is one of the works of the flesh. Everybody has a measure of it. But when you find it, your goal is to annihilate it, not to exercise it. Because everything you exercise becomes stronger. Everything you start becomes weaker. You want to make sure, right, smear campaign. You want to make sure that whenever you find that manifesting in your life, that you begin to destroy that area. It's always good to get counseling in that area. It's always good to be honest and get have, become accountable in that area. And it's always good to get deliverance in that area. You want to intentionally target that area because it's a it's the fallen nature of humans. But anytime, again, when you have relinquished your control, you will become controlling. You relinquish your control to sin or you relinquish your control to people. You will become controlling and you may not even realize it. You may not realize a lot of the things that you've done and how it hurts people or how, how it has impacted people. You may not realize that you've sabotaged some of the things that have come in your life. And like I said, a lot of times God can send gifts into your life. And I think this, God tests you with gifts. And when I say gifts, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about your, your ability to do a thing. I'm talking about people. Some of the people that God sent into your life it, are gifts. And check this out. Every gift doesn't necessarily outrank you. Every gift doesn't necessarily outrank you. When I don't think spirituality, but I'm, well, you can think spirit, but, but every gift doesn't outrank you. Meaning that best friend who may not be as smart as you, she could be a gift into your life. But you want to always be prayerful about every person that enters into your life. Not only prayerful, what is the word for this year? Intentional. Be intentional. And make sure that you are not controlling people and you're not being controlled by people. It's okay to set boundaries. It's okay to enforce those boundaries. And you can go get my books. If you, if you need help setting boundaries, you want to learn about boundaries, get my books, The Book of Boundaries. Get my book. It's The Book of Boundaries. The first one is the black one. It's called The Black Book of Boundaries. It's on Amazon.com. Get The Black Book of Boundaries. Um, get the, the second one is The Green One. It's called The Green Book of Boundaries. The third one is the blue one. It's called the blue book of boundaries. The fourth one is the purple one. It's called the purple book of boundaries. And the fifth one is the red one. It's the red book of boundaries. I can guarantee you it would change your life. Now you got you to gotta apply your will to it, uh, but they will change your life. It will help you to learn how to set boundaries. But understand this, before you build a thing, count the cost because boundaries tear down things. 
Boundaries, when you set boundaries, and it is going to cause relationships to falter and fail because boundaries can, you can be connected to the right person the wrong way. Let me say that. You can be connected to the right person the wrong way. So that relationship as it is has to end because you have to set boundaries um, and, and to sit back and say, okay, this wasn't good or what have you. I've, I've talked to women, for example, who've met guys and they've gotten uh, prophetic words. They've gotten confirmation that God is saying, yes, this is the man I want you to marry. This is your husband or what have you. And then they connected to him the wrong way. They connected to him illegally. They had sex with him. They connected to him the wrong way. And the next thing you know, relationships start going to hell. Relationships start going to hell. The relationship starts falling apart. They get married. The relationship is going to hell. The, the thing about it is now you have to disconnect how you connected with that person, meaning you have to relinquish your power over that person. Right. The red one is the last one, the red book of boundaries. You have to disconnect your power, even if you're married to him. You have to disconnect the way, meaning you have to divorce the way that you, you have to divorce the witchcraft. You got to divorce the control. You got to divorce the ungodly soul tie and you have to build on a godly foundation. You have to build on a godly foundation. And I tell people a lot of times relationships don't survive that transition because they can, but both people have to be intentional because the person that has been a God in your life, the person that has been a, de been a deity, people get drunk off power. Once you have given them your authority, you have relinquished your authority to them. You have given them your power. People can get, get addicted to that and they feel entitled to it. And so consequently, when you start pulling it back or withholding it, they can feel rejected. They can feel some type of way. They feel hurt. They feel all of those bad things. But that doesn't mean that you go back to giving them that. What it means is that, hey, we got to talk <laughs> because, hey, I can't we can't do, we can't do this. This this is wrong. This is ungodly. This is against the will of God. We're going to have to build this thing the right way. We got to build this on the wrong on the right foundation. We got to un uproot this relationship at the kingdom of darkness. And we got to go over here and sow it in the kingdom of God. Because all of the works of the flesh are manifesting because of the garden that this is planted in. We got to stop this. So I love you. I want to hold on to you. I want to be a part of your life, but we can't do it this way. And then you got to give the person the ability to make a, cho a choice. And God said, win them by your behavior. And I'm talking to the married folk. Win them by your behavior. That doesn't mean that they're going to be one because God then says, if the unbeliever want to depart, let them depart. Am I promoting divorce? No. What am I promoting? Stay in the will of God. Regardless of what it can, what regardless of what it cost you, don't you ever put a person over the will of God, and don't you ever think you're gonna temporarily move out of the will of God and then come back once you secure the person. It typically works the other way. Satan will use that soul tie as a noose. You don't do that. You repent and you realize, hey, I made myself an idol. I made this person an idol. I made marriage an idol. I made my deficiency an idol. And I repent for that. Before you build a thing, count the cost. Sometimes building is preceded by tearing down. You got to count the cost. If I ask somebody to come tear down a building, they're going to charge me for it. I got to know how much it costs. Count the cost. And you got to be willing to let go of anything that requires that you stay outside the will of God. Or... Anything that requires you go outside the will of God or you stay outside the will of God. Choose God over all things. I had to get to that space in my life because I wasn't the person. I was an idol worshiper. By idol, I meant I idolized relationships. I idolized marriage. I was an idol worshiper. And God broke me all the way down. <laughs> he broke me down to the, the smallest molecule. And that's how he dealt, dealt with idolatry in my life. He broke me down. One crossroad after another, one crossroad after another, he broke me down. And I, in order for me to get free, I had to repeatedly keep choosing him. And it wasn't easy because every time I look at what I stood to lose, I, I cried. I looked and I said, but can we? 
And God said, I'm not telling you to walk away. I'm just saying, keep following me. Keep going after me. Keep coming after me. But if I keep, he, 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 he already told, keep coming after me. Turn your head back around. Keep coming after me. You'll be all right. Keep coming after me. Maybe he'll be won by your behavior, but maybe not. If he don't choose me, then he won't choose you. Keep coming after me. Man, I know, I, I know what you mean, sis. That's when you go into the level of agony. I have been in straight, pure agony. But I've had to chase God because what I was doing was breaking curses in my life. Breaking curses in my life. Had to chase God and watch myself go all the way down. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a secret. Suicide is just, you. This, the suicide ideation is typically the product of you not choosing God. And you keep investing in something and making it into a God in your life. And then when, the bigger that thing gets, the more of your authority it requires. And the more of your authority it requires, the more it starts to consume you. And the more it starts to consume you, the more you realize that this thing is eating you away. But walking away, so it's like staying is horrible. And it's like, uh, and walking away seems tormenting. The only other option out, only other way out seems to be suicide. Don't you ever kill yourself for an idol. Don't you ever present yourself as an offering to an idol. It's the ultimate sacrifice. I'm tired. I don't, want, I don't want to feel this no more. I don't want to feel. I know agony. I know it. I know it. I know agony. I know the feeling of straight agony. I'm talking about to the core of my being. I know what that feels like. And I've met it many times. I've, I've, I've been on that trail of agony many, many times. I had to cry the tears. My mother refused to cry. I had to cry to tears. My family, did, uh, my, my predecessors, my, 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 my parents and my grandparents, my great-grandparents refused to cry. And some of you, your kids got to cry those tears because you won't cry. Because the path that you put them on is the path that they're going to walk on. And they got to deal with whatever demons you didn't get rid of. They got to deal with whatever sins you didn't get rid of. I had to sit there and I came to realize I get it. I understand. And they helped me to forgive because I said, I understand why my mother didn't go all the way down because my mom wasn't. She never allowed herself to get this strong. It, this, what I, this right here, it probably would have killed her. It probably would have killed her. And I remember telling God, this is killing me. He said, I know. <laughs> I said, I, want, I wanted to kill your flesh. And he had, to get, he had to get a servant out of me. He had to get me to that space where I said, there is nothing or no one I will ever choose over you ever in my life, ever again. I won't change. I don't choose me. I don't choose nothing, anything. No. Because I came to know the love of God. It wasn't just them not wanting to be tortured again. Of course, I don't ever want to go through that mess there ever again in my whole wild life. When God get through, when you get through, uh-uh. <laughs> uh-uh. Uh-uh. Because deliverance sometimes look like the devil attacking you and God chastising you at the same time. Can I catch a break somewhere? Can I get some relief somewhere? But you have to keep moving. He says, it's okay. He says, it's okay to be weary. It's okay for you to be tired, but faint not, which means don't give up. Your, tear, your children will often have to cry to tears. You refuse to cry. Some of you are having a cry of tears that your mother, your grandmama, your great grandmother, probably all the way up to 15 generations ago, they refused to cry. 50 generations ago, they were supposed to get delivered. They didn't. And so now you got to cry to tears. They never cry. Because every time you come to the crossroad, you, you're, you're, you're forced to choose between the path that they took or the path that nobody has taken in your family. And it's a, it, it, sometimes you got to blaze a trail and it's scary. Because the path that they took, everything is cut. It's a wilderness, but still. The world would pay, but this one here, you gotta pave it. It ain't nobody paved it. Nobody paved it. So now you gotta go down this road and you gotta be called stupid. You gotta go through all of that and you gotta deal with the pain. And then after a while, you're constantly watching relationship after relationship fail. 
makes you question, am I on the right path? Yeah, there. But you just got to keep choosing God again and again and again. Got to keep choosing him. Got to keep choosing him. I can tell you, in the end, you will be glad that you did. In the end, you will be glad that you did. Because you start having these amazing encounters with God. I had such an encounter with God. I told you guys about the encounter with when God took me through deliverance from uh, unforgiveness. I had an encounter with him last night that was uh, just as powerful. But it's always a crossroads that you're constantly coming to where you're required to choose your preference, to let go of your preference, just to follow behind him. When you know when you're at the end, the hardest parts of a season are the end of a season and the beginning of a season. The end of a season is hard because typically you you've mastered that season, you've built relationships, you've come to love people. You're typically not wanting to let go. You got soul ties. You've made investments in that season. Everything, and you're being required to walk into the unfamiliar. God gives me peace. God bless you. Thank you. You're required to walk into the unforget the unfamiliar. And then there's warfare. There's a there's a great deal of warfare at the end of a season. It, it, it doesn't lift. It, there's a great deal of warfare at the end of a season because before you break through, you have to break down. There's typically a breakdown before there's a breakthrough. But when you get to the beginning of a season, there's also warfare because you got to deal with the guard, the the guards. These are the demonic spirits that guard a season. They're good, demonic spirits that Guard the exit of a season that try to keep you. These are the ones that had a leash on you through soul ties and what have you. But then you got to go through the learning curve of a new season, the frustration, the doubt, the insecurity. You got to build up your faith before you can go through the door. So you have to move around in the wilderness until you get your faith to go into the promised land. And then when you finally start going into that new season, you're now a student in that season. You're a student in that season. In the last season, you were a teacher. You mastered that. And most people don't go from season to season or grow from season to season because they love being the teacher, but they're, you, to become the student, you have to humble yourself. So you go from being having people looking up to you to all of a sudden you're the student all over again. That's what growth looks like. And most people won't humble themselves and go down and become the student because they mastered one season. But when you come to student in another season, you have to deal with perpetual rejection because you are, no, you are of no benefit in the beginning of a season to people. So nobody wants to really affiliate themselves with you who are part of that season because the people who are on your level don't see anything. They may want to be a companion, but most folks don't, you know, because now you come into that season and most of the people that don't want to affiliate you because most of the people have been there for a while. A lot of people have been there for a while. And so the only thing that they can give you is mentorship. And when you first come in, you're probably dealing with entitlement. You don't realize you have to pay for mentorship. You can't just get their not their knowledge and their revelation for free or what have you. So you come into that season, you're used to being the teacher of the last season, but now or a, a teacher in the last season. But you're now you're a student of this particular season. Um, and then when you're coming into this particular season, now you have to deal with rejection. Now you have to deal with people not opening up to you. You got to deal with all of those things. Um, then you also going to have and then you, you're you going to have growth spurt. The rate in which you grow can set the stage for um, warfare. Because if you start growing, like if you're intentional, then every season has principalities. These are the principle setters of that season. I talk about this in my book, but these are the principle setters of that season. The principalities of that season, once they see your growth, a lot of times can be like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And so a lot of times you start dealing with sabotage, you start dealing with stuff, come, uh, but nobody wants to invite you or what have you. And then after you get to a space where you kind of grow into the height of just like most people of that season, um, you're going to start dealing with the principalities of that season because they want they notice your growth spurt. Because most people have development to delay, spiritually speaking, meaning they get to a certain height in the season and they don't like the warfare. So they, when every time they get to the crossroad, they keep making the decision just to go in a circle rather than to do a new thing or to be a new thing. Uh, they keep making a decision to go into go in a circle because they want to be accepted. They want to be liked. And so most people are sheep. They follow the crowd. The majority of people on the face of this planet are sheep. They will follow the crowd. But leaders typically take the hard path. Leaders typically take the hard path. 
if you take the hard path, you're going to go through hell. You're going to go through hell. I know I kind of over answered that, but that's that's that. Uh, but you, you take the you take that path, then there's going to be great deals of warfare or what have you. Then at, there's a space of time where you become a principal setter. It can be a small one, um, but then you can become a principal setter, meaning people start looking at you. You're still going to deal with warfare, but then there's a time where you're not you're no longer a principal setter. Uh, but then you still have to deal with the warfare. Um, and then that's when the principalities of the season will say, hey, we cool with you. Come, you know, you can be just like us. But you've already seen their character when you were a student. So you already know these are not good people. So you're like, I, I don't want to feel with y'all like that. So then it's going to create another level of warfare um, because now you're separating yourself or allowing God to sanctify you. Um, but what have you. And then you have to go back through it all over again. When you're starting to exit that season, you're dealing with the warfare of the season of somebody pulling you back, soul ties and all that other stuff. Um, and then you are, you go into the hallway of another season. You don't go straight into another season, you go into the hallway. And so this is a time where you're having to go through the deliverance. You're walking alone. Um, you don't necessarily have people that want to walk with you. All that you're dealing with wild animals in the form of narcissists, all of that. Um, you feel alone. So you are vulnerable at that time because you're dealing with a lot of breakups um, you're dealing with a lot of separation or what have you. So you go into that that hallway and um, when you go into a new season again, you come go into a new season again. Uh, typically, you go in as a student. You go in as a student and then you got to go back through that cycle all over again. The majority of people get tired of the cycle. They get tired of the cycle. So they just sit back and they find a season and they start hanging up furniture. They start putting up furniture in that season. They start hanging up pictures in that season. And God said, that ain't that's not the place I called you to settle. I never called you to settle in that mindset. I never called you to settle in that way of thought. I never called you to settle in that. But they start settling because they start making friends they, and their, their friendships start becoming uh, strongholds. Most people deal with, you know, that. And so their friendships start becoming strongholds or what have you. And so now, next thing you know, they're so tired. They, they already, they married that season. And so they can't go to the next season. But that's a whole other message. You can find that in my book of boundaries. I talk about it there. My book on relational acuity, I deal with it, I think, in greater depth there. I think that's going to be powerful. But I love me some y'all. Right. Comfort is, an, a comf, comfort is the enemy of purpose. Comfort is the enemy of purpose. I've learned, you know, um, when you're on this journey called life, you can get comfortable. But it's typically at the point of comfort that God starts to rip your comfort zone away. He starts to rip your conference on the way. It's okay to be afraid. When you come to a crossroad, there's typically fear there. But you know what? Always disobey fear. Always disobey fear. Always come against fear. Chase what chases you. That's what you have to do. Uh, one thing I've learned is not to be controlled by fear, not to give in to fear, not to give in to the temptation to be, in, you know, to, to bow down to fear or to give in to the demands of fear. At the end of the day, I realize I'm here for a purpose. That's how I think. I'm here for an assignment. I have a purpose and I've got, I've given God my yes and he going to get this. Yes. Okay. Uh, what have you? So if fear is telling me, you better tell him no, no, I'm gonna tell fear. No, I'm gonna tell fear. No. And I'm gonna keep going to a fear. I'll go to a fear in tears. I'll go to a fear, but I'm gonna keep coming with my sword and whatever falls and breaks down behind me. It is what it is, but I'm gonna keep going toward my assignment. If fear is guarding it, I'm coming toward it with the sword of truth and I will castrate it. I will rip his heart out. I will cast. I will cut off it. I will decapitate it. That's the word I was looking for. Cash rate it too, so it don't reproduce in my life. But I will decapitate it. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. All right. I love you guys. I pray that this message bless you. It was way longer than I wanted it to. I still got to do a part two to this. But like I said in the beginning, I'm not going to do the next one. It's not going to be a part two. Uh, because I want to give you guys some uh, systems of how to get past it. I wanted to teach you how to identify it today. But I have to give you some systems, some instructions, some wisdom of how to get past it. But I'll likely do that in the next week or two, uh, three or what have you. We'll talk about it another time. But I love you guys and we'll talk again soon. All right. Bye bye.